Hello. Good evening. Welcome. As you can tell from my pink tie, it's our first meeting of spring. So glad to have a nice crowd of people here with us. Uh, we are going to get the meeting started. And Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll, please? Uh, actually, may adequate I read the notice adequate complaint. notice? Yep, please. <laughs> adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by the City Clerk's Office in the preparation of the Council Annual Meeting Notice, dated December 15th, 2022, which was properly distributed and posted per statutory requirements. Please be advised that the fire exits are to my right, your left, and at the back of the room. Thank you very much. Now we can call the roll. Ms. Allen. Here. Ms. Fox. Here. Ms. Hairston. Ms. Hamlet. Here. Dr. Levine. Here. Mr. Miniker. Here. President Vartan. Present. Okay. We will now do the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll be led by our Fire Chief, Eric Evans. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Madam Clerk, would you now please, the, please read the explanatory notes regarding closed session and hearings and comments. A closed session meeting is authorized by state statute, was announced and held prior to the start of this meeting, and the known items for discussion were listed on the published closed session agenda. Please be advised that council meetings are broadcast live on Comcast Channel 36 <coughs> and Verizon Channel 30 and rebroadcast on Thursdays and Saturdays on HTTV on Comcast 36 and Verizon 33. When invited to speak, please come to the lectern, clearly state your name and address, spell your last name, and speak into the podium microphone so that your comments can be understood by all and properly recorded. Whenever an audience or council member reads from a prepared statement, please give or email a copy to the city clerk's office at cityclerk at cityofsummit.org. To help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers are asked to limit their comments to approximately three minutes or so in length unless you are using an electronic device to follow the meeting agenda or need it for professional emergency contact purposes, please turn it off. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to approval of the minutes from the regular and closed session meetings of March 7th. Do we have a motion on those? So, so moved. moved. And a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And as I was not here, I will abstain from those. All right, and that is adopted. Okay, um, we are moving on to reports. Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Council President. Welcome everyone uh, to the first full day of spring. Uh, so, a few things. Uh, the April 1st deadline is approaching for Summit Youth Academy applications. Two one-week sessions will be held from July 17th to July 21, and July 24 to July 28 from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. daily and are open to children ages 11 to 14. Each year, except for a break during the pandemic, young cadets have a lot of fun learning about the role of police officers in our community. Go to cityofsummit.org slash police for more information and photos from previous summers. My office is right upstairs there and I hear these kids down here every year, except for the pandemic. They have a great time and we have a, a veteran graduate from Police Academy. The first class. Yes, years the ago. first class. Um, so it's really a great experience and the kids, they, they, they learn a lot and they love it. Uh, this afternoon, I attended the OM3D program at Summit High School and watched as student participants and our police and fire and EMS work together to convey to bleachers full of students in 11th and 12th grade the sim simulated fatal and tragic impact of drinking drug use, and distracted driving. It was a very powerful program, and I know it took more than a year of preparation and a tremendous amount of work to pull this together. I am thankful to the Summit High School Guidance Department, teachers, and student participants who worked with Captain Ryan Peters, police officer Sean Thompson, and other members of the police department. Congratulations and well done. I look forward to its continuation at the assembly tomorrow morning. And to everyone out there who has questions or complaints about anything in the city, please reach out to your elected officials or city staff directly rather than posting to social media. I know it's fun to vent on social media, but you don't necessarily get accurate information that way. So please contact one of us. 
While social media is a useful tool, we do not always see what is posted on non-city channels, and your concern or issue cannot be immediately addressed. Our city website has contact information for all of us in the dais and for city staff. See Click Fix is also an important way to report service or infrastructure problems. Or if you want to post on social media, the city has Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, chan YouTube channels that are monitored. Thank you. And, and lastly, um, part of my job is to appoint members of the Board of Education. Just wanted to announce that uh, at their reorganization in May, I will be um, reappointing Jan Cho. He served three years. He'll be serving uh, another three years. And um, Donna Miller is leaving the board, having served for six years, led the board as president through the lockdown and COVID, and that was really cool. a challenging uh, job for her, or for anyone. Um, and I will be appointing in her place um, Eileen Kelly, um, who lives in Summit as well, obviously. So that's it. That's all I have. Thank you, Council President. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On to City Administrator Michael Rogers. Thank you, Council President. Uh, you'll be happy to know I have three items to report on today. So, uh, Finally, thank you. And good evening, everybody. On. Uh, Catching on to that. <laughs> uh, so the first one is just a curbside leaf collection uh, will begin on April 3rd and continue through April 21st. Uh, leaves should be placed at the curb in paper, biodegradable bags for pickup on your household trash collection day. Uh, property owners should not rake or blow leaves in piles into the street. Uh, and please do not include twigs, branches, or other yard debris in leaf bags. Uh, second item, uh, there is a date change for the Summit Free Market event in April. Uh, it has been rescheduled from April 8th to April 15th due to lack of volunteer availability. Uh, the Summit Free Market will uh, also be open for one additional uh, Friday afternoon event each month, excluding the month of November. Uh, the schedule is posted on the city website at cityofsummit.org. Uh, just a reminder, uh, you must be a summit resident with a valid transfer station permit to go uh, to the summit free market events. Uh, and please visit cityofsummit.org slash parking to apply and get more information on how to do so. And then the last item, uh, the state of New Jersey senior freeze program uh, reimburses eligible senior citizens and disabled uh, persons for uh, property tax or mobile home park site fee increases on their uh, principal residence. Uh, the deadline for the 2022 uh, applications is October 31st, uh, 2023. Uh, more information is available on the city website at cityofsummit.org. And that's all I have for this evening. Council President, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I have a quick report. Uh, thank you very much to Council President Pro Tem, uh, Susan Hairston, for filling in for me at the last council meeting. Uh, after three years COVID-free, it caught up to me. Uh, but I was grateful for Susan's leadership in my absence. Um, we're expecting she will join us uh, a little bit later this evening. Um, at our reorganization, I spoke uh, about a number of specific initiatives that we would undertake this year. Two of them are, one, ensure the utility companies fix the roads they have ripped up during necessary upgrades. And second, support the efforts of nonprofit groups and city departments to assist our unhoused population. So tonight, I'm pleased that we'll hear from professionals on both of these topics. I want to get to those important conversations, so I'll close out my report with just a few more quick pieces of information. First, conversations have begun with our, with our first responders, our neighboring communities, and the professionals in Mountain Valley Communication Center, as well as the county, as we work to outline options for the future of our emergency communications system. Uh, we will outline what the options are and perform a cost-benefit analysis in order to ensure that the next step for the city is what is best for Summit. Um, Facebook Live events have been going very well, uh, and they will continue. Um, Mayor and Council will also have a table uh, at an upcoming farmer's market event to share information and answer questions as well. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, we will now move on. We have the Volunteer of the Year Award, and I will turn it over to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Council President. So five years ago, we uh, Council established this award for, um, to, to recognize someone in the community who has been volunteering for a long time in, in all sorts of aspects. Um, and it was with great pleasure that um, Donna Pazella is the recipient of this year's Volunteer of the Year Award. So Donna, if you will join me at the podium.
born and raised in Summit, Donna attended Jefferson Elementary School and is a graduate of Summit High School. A true hilltopper, Donna is a third generation Summit resident and co-owns Sweet Nothings with her sister Alyssa. Both Donna and her sister are truly committed to the community, believing that together we are stronger and better. Donna's contributions to Summit include supporting the Department of Community Programs events with prizes, the Summit Library's Summer Reading Program, volunteering at the Farmer's Market Gift Table for Grace, donating to countless school events, including theatrical productions, fundraisers, tricky trays, donating to the Special Needs Prom and the Summit Historical Society. Donna was an active member of Summit Downtown Inc., spearheading marketing efforts and was a co-founder of Summit's Girls Night Out event. She supports our places of worship, and many other local organizations, not only in Summit, but surrounding towns as well. Donna has been involved with supporting and volunteering at fundraisers and events for the EPIC School, an educational institution for teaching children and adults with autism. Along with her sister, Donna provides projects for the students to teach them skills in order to be trained to actively participate and contribute to society. Along with her nephew, Zachary Brooks, Donna has enlightened the community by bringing awareness, respect, and attention for individuals affected by developmental disabilities with Zachary's, quote, we all fit together initiative. More importantly, Donna has provided a safe spot at Sweet Nothings for our community's children, whether they need a place to wait for a ride, someone to talk to, a place to ask for help or assistance with a class project. And believe me, if you're ever around Sweet Nothings when there's a half day at school, <laughs> you think there, that's the safe haven. It's a wonderful place. Um, in 2018, Donna received the Women of Excellence Business Leadership Award from the Union County Commission on the Status of Women, and in 2019, the Good Scout Award from the Boy Scouts. And now hopefully you can add this to your uh, collection of recognition because we're very proud of you and very, very grateful for everything you do. Thank you so much. And it says, in recognition of your many contributions as a dedicated community leader and visionary, your outstanding ability to communicate with a wide variety of people in a respectful and compassionate manner has greatly benefited our community. You understand the importance of honest listening as well as speaking. In appreciation of your generosity and countless hours of community involvement and for being a shining example of volunteerism in our community, presented on March 21, 2023 at the, by the Summit Common Council. Thank you. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. And this, I just want to say, this established this five years ago, and uh, I, along with two members of the council, this year was council president and Billy Hamill, uh, talk about who's going to be the recipient. We make a recommendation to council, and obviously, unanimously, they all agree. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, congratulations, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mayor. We're moving on now to our presentations, and um, we are very, very pleased to have with us uh, Mike Callahan, who is the Director of the Office of Homelessness Prevention uh, with the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. Um, so we will invite you up and have a little presentation. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Council President. Do we have it up there? For mm -hmm. okay. Just has to double click on it. It's right on the desktop above. Oh, the desktop, gotcha. Perfect, thank you. Can everybody hear me? This is good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Just double click on the first slide on the left. So X out of that. We're uh... Escape. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, that was fun. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Callahan. I'm the director of the Office of Homelessness Prevention at DCA. Right. Um, thanks for having me tonight, and particularly 
um, with the ongoing meetings, right, with some of the municipal leadership here at Summit. So this is going to be a high-level overview of what we see at the state level with regards to unsheltered homelessness and homelessness prevention right here can, in can, Summit. Can we ask you to speak up just a little bit? Sure. Is that, that a little that, better? Yes, yes. Okay. And for the people watching at home as well. Okay, excellent. Thank Thanks. All right. So with this, with the presentation, we'll go through the population census of persons accessing homelessness prevention services. Here in Summit, kind of what uh, our understanding are of the key levers, particularly in reducing both risk of homelessness here in Summit, and also to, um, all right, try, it, taking a good solid effort at substantially and rapidly reducing unsheltered homelessness within the city. Uh, we'll go over kind of COC participation to include what that acronym means and also look through a potential roadmap for municipal and provider process, right, in order to engage in some what we call by name matching and case conferencing, right? So overall, right, in 2022, uh, in through a data extract from the New Jersey Homeless Management Information System, there's been, there are 66 total people that received services for the prevention of homelessness in the city of Summit last year, right? Um, importantly, these persons were only captured in New Jersey HMIS, right, by providers operating within the municipality, right? Um, right now, there's a strong data gap between capturing discrete and granular information on persons experiencing unsheltered homelessness in Summit versus those that are accessing supportive services and services to either rapidly end their homelessness that was precipitated by a recent event or um, those experiencing risk of homelessness through conditions like or situations having to do with eviction and things like that, right? Um, importantly, right, you guys have in Summit, with Summit Warm Hearts, probably one of the most impactful faith-based organizations and responses to homelessness that I've seen throughout the state, right, in my tenure over the, over the past nine months. Um, and particularly, one of the things with accessing funding either through my office or HUD or some different funding streams in order to kind of amplify efforts, a key, a, a key kind of milestone to, to overcome and access that funding is to, going to be to overcome this information gap that we talked about earlier. So in looking at homelessness, right, there's about a 50-50 split with regards to persons that are at risk at homelessness that were seen by homelessness prevention providers meaning that 50% of the people that were accessing programs within Summit for homelessness prevention through a, summit for, through a provider operating within the city limits, right, were Summit <coughs> residents and reported their last permanent address as being in Summit, right? The other 50% in 2022 being outside of Summit. When you look at the gender distribution of uh, per the persons receiving services, you can see that it's both skewed to an older population and also to that it is more heavily female than it is male. Um, importantly, uh, what's not up here is a comparative, uh, a comparative visualization where the majority of homelessness as we see throughout the state and even here in Union County um, writ large falls more within the demographic buckets of 31 to 40 and 21 to 30 versus homelessness has a definite older characteristic here with regards to, with regards to the population here in Summit. Um, when we look at causes of homelessness, there's also a dif difference between what are reported by persons, right, especially with homelessness prevention programs, right? Um, by and large, right, there's a distribution of causes of homelessness that are as varied as the people that are accessing services, right? When you look at homelessness in both throughout the state and in Union County, one out of every four persons experiencing homelessness in 2022 were that homelessness was caused by eviction, right? Versus here in Summit, that's not necessarily the case, right? So, and looking kind of, and this data is from the city council, right? Uh, looking at the impact of some of Warm Hearts, it's fantastic, right? Total of 63 persons served. It looks like it's more heavily skewed towards, ma uh, towards male guests. Um, there were six housing voucher selections, which is fantastic for, for a conversion rate of 60% with applications. It looks like there was additional five successful housing stabilizations and four folks that were engaged with services are still placed in receiving health care. So that's, Really fantastic, right? Um, particularly, our, it looks like some earlier relationships, right, with, bo with both Warm Hearts, that Warm Hearts leverage in order to expedite the exit of these folks from homelessness or continue to grow. Particularly, um, the continued partnership in New Jersey Transit Police, um, of Officer Sean Pfeiffer's fantastic, and Inspector Kirk Priglione, right? 
Um, if you've been to Penn Station recently, right, a lot of the efforts with regards to homelessness around there were led by those two folks, right, and particularly doing it compassionately and not just shutting it down and kicking folks out, right? So kind of understanding the somewhat warm hearts ended last week, um, there exists the need in order to kind of expedite the exit of persons experiencing unsheltered homelessness throughout the city. And to kind of accelerate this, right, build, build upon the existing coalitions, but also tie in both the municipality and existing providers directly to entities that are also not only gonna be able to facilitate collaboration, but more importantly, funding, right? And so in order to kind of access this funding and also to, to access these collaborative services, right, there's two real key levers in the near term. The first is having the municipal government services and service agencies within the city participate in the Union County continuum of care, and we'll kind of defi we'll define what that is here in a second on the next slide. But then also, there's already folks in, in between Warm Hearts and also some municipal providers right, accessing the COC ecosystem. By formally joining, you, you are able to access year over year guaranteed funding to address unsheltered homelessness, to address sheltered homelessness, and to address preventative measures for homelessness. Um, two additional key levers, right, that you might want to be thinking about our increased capacity, particularly leveraging your PHA, right? Uh, I can tell you from meeting with Nichelle, Car with Nichelle Carver from the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness yesterday, that there are gonna be a tremendous amount of opportunities coming out this year um, from HUD, particularly marrying the ability of PHAs to go after special voucher programs in order to address unsheltered homelessness, right? And that also aligns with the federal strategic plan to address unsheltered homeless homelessness by 25%, by 2025, right? And then also to, um, through kind of the process that we talk about and looking through the continuum of care, ensuring a shorter time of signal where the second someone, no matter what, where that person kind of exists within the municipality, that first signal of homelessness, the faster getting that person to both care and intervention is the faster that person can exit. So importantly, what's a continuum of care, right? So a COC, um, and this is not the HUD definition, this is an approachable definition. It's a, a collaborative network of organizations, agencies, and community members that work together to address and prevent homelessness in a specific group, geographic area. In Union County, the COC coordinates funding, resources, services, and strategies to support individuals and families experiencing homelessness, aiming to help them find stable housing and prevent future episodes of homelessness. In simpler terms, the COC is a team effort throughout multiple stakeholders in order to tackle homelessness as a, um, as a community. Importantly, with joining the COC, there's also, mul and having the COC being led by Union County, there's also access to other funding streams that are non-HUD related, to include the, homeless, the Hom Homelessness Trust Fund, right, which if you own a home in Union County and you pay taxes, and it, there's also a big chance when you bought your house that you, com that you contributed funding to the Homelessness Trust Fund, right? There's, um, there are also additional funding through both the Union County through what was known as SHUSH, right, which just stands for Supportive Services for the Homeless, and also to funding through my office, right? And so currently only one organization in Summit participates in the Union County COC, which is Bridges, right? Three of the larger partner organizations that I referenced earlier, right, so Bridgeway, uh, the Elizabeth Coalition also participate, right? And also New Jersey Transit is a member, um, is, is a member, of the COC, but not a voting member. So when you add all the organizations providing services in Summit, providers in Summit gain access not only to the network of peer organizations, right, but also get access to a sustainable funding opportunity, both through the Office of Homelessness Prevention, which is my office, and also federal funding through HUD, right? Um, importantly, from my understanding of what I've been briefed on, a large part of the homelessness response here in Summit has been driven by private philanthropy and donations, right? So importantly also, right, the Union County Continuum of Care is currently designing their coordinated entry process and why that matters, right? So right now, right, I guarantee you, if you ask anyone experiencing homelessness within city limits, right, what's the number one reason they would, don't wanna go to any county welfare agency or someplace else? Because they wanna take a trip to Elizabeth or Plainfield, right? So coordinated entry is a process that makes it easier for people experiencing homelessness or those at risk of homelessness to access the help they need. It provides a single standardized way for individuals and families to be assessed and connected to appropriate housing and support services, right? And importantly, it's a one-stop, no wrong door, right? Where folks can get access, but also to get prioritized accordingly and also get screened for services more rapidly. 
Right now, Union County COC is in the middle phase of designing their coordinated entry system, right? Um, it's been noted in both talking to the county, right, understanding different stakeholders and talking to providers throughout the county that the western part of Union County often suffer, suffers from a paucity of providers and engagement. Right? So this is an opportunity to kind of influence that. So the value proposition, right? So we've seen throughout the state, right, that municipal and law enforcement participation in COCs is valuable because it creates a more comprehensive and effective approach to addressing homelessness. Similarly, it lets municipal policy be at the table where millions of dollars are being, are being distributed, right? If you've been in Newark recently, right, if you've seen the Newark strategic plan to functionally end chronic unsheltered homelessness, right, a key, a key precipitating cause there, right, is Mayor Baraka and the city leadership and also the Newark police joining the COC and taking an active voice to assert agency in that continuum of care, right? It ensures alignment between local government and philanthropy resources, and also too, right, the partnership, it, right, we see, we, we're seeing increasingly months over months, right, that where municipalities have joined COCs, right, especially those that have seen rapid growth in homelessness, there's also concomitant decreases in homelessness because there's greater coordination and there's also too alignment between that local policy and in some cases county policy, right? Um, additionally, right, a prerequisite to any funding that I deploy, right, is participation in the COC, right? I have currently $1.25 million in additional funding for Union County alone that is up for grabs right now. Um, if you participate, if an organization participates in the COC, right, and they're a member of the COC, they're able to access and submit an RFP proposal to access that funding, right? So here's an example of roadmap, right, of both the conversations that I've had already and also to what things kind of look like, right? So this four-week process, right, is already, with the, the items that we're gonna talk about here in week one has already kind of been engaged in, right? Um, particularly, right, what remains to be done is scheduling and holding meetings with stakeholders to inform them about the COC, discuss the benefits of joining, and assess the interest and capacity to participate. Importantly, I'm here as, as a technical assistance role, right, not to lead this process. This is a process wholly driven and home rule matters here, right? And so importantly too, establishing in this first week of, of doing so, establishing a core team of representatives from the city and community partner agencies to lead the process of joining the COC, right? From an initial kind of mapping, right, with, with some folks in the municipality, it looks like there's about six or seven agencies here in Summit that should be joining the COC. Uh, week two, right, engaging in collaborative planning and resource assessment, right? Particularly, right, identifying strong gaps in existing services and resources and to develop a prioritized list of needs, right? From an a, a quick look at um, homelessness data in 2023, there's quite a few folks that even that would maybe, that would be quite eligible for a housing choice voucher should that opportunity come, but that would also rapidly benefit from a rapid rehousing program, right? Because they are work eligible, they have earned income, and it's tenable that they'd be able to house to be housed even within city limits, right? And then after, after the end of week two, direction, creating an action plan, right? So with the integration, the application, right, the application should take probably no, long, no, no longer than 30 minutes to apply. You send it to Jennifer Navas and Christina Toploski over at the county, right? And then you'll be informed of the next meeting, right? There's an onboarding process that you have to go through in order to acclimate, but also too, and importantly, right, COC, C, participating in the COC gives you access to the New Jersey Homeless Management Information System. And what's important about that is your law enforcement is able to work with New Jersey Transit, pull, some, pull a contact up on your phone, see every single person, that, every single organization that this person's interfaced with, right? And, and contacts in that organization in order to leverage and rap, more rapidly expedite an end to their homelessness, right? Um, so week four and onward, right? And of course, this is definitely flexible. Right, launch the impl implementation of the action plan, develop a communication strategy, particularly um, leveraging the awesome work that you're already doing here. And then, you know, it, what's I think a fantastic opportunity here is to continue in, in to engage those sources of private philanthropy that's really driving some deep impact here. So, great. Thanks. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Callahan, for the presentation. Um, I want to start off our conversation uh, among council by thanking everyone who has been involved in caring for our unhoused population uh, so far this year. The police, the first aid squad, Atlantic Health, uh, the nonprofit community, especially Bridges, 
and Grace, and of course the Interfaith Council, the various houses of worship, and all the individuals who were involved uh, in Summit Warm Hearts overnight and day programs. Um, special thank you to Mayor Radist for assembling a working group of people uh, that has been working very well together, um, and council members Fox and Levine who were part of that group as well. Um, I want to open up to questions and comments um, from council, but I want to start by saying that for me, I think we need to address the problem of homelessness in our community, not to get rid of homeless people so that we don't see them, but rather to recognize that unhoused, unhoused people are in Summit for the same reasons that everyone else is in Summit. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, and we want to help our homeless residents get the help that they need and into long-term housing. So I think working together, it is our responsibility as the governing body uh, to continue along the roadmap uh, that was outlined by Dr. Callahan. Uh, I believe we should draft a plan with specific short, mid, and long-term goals, uh, strategic objectives to use to get us to the goal of ending homelessness in Summit. Um, and of course, I believe as a municipality, we should join in uh, the Union County COC, uh, assuming and hoping that we get consensus of council to do that. So I want to uh, open it up to members of council for comments or questions at this time. I'm happy to make a comment. Thank you, Dr. Callahan. Nice to see you again. Um, I believe when we last spoke, you shared some of the statistics on municipalities in the county and how they ranked um, as far as um, a number of homeless residents based on last permanent address. And if I recall correctly, um, Summit was, I think, ranked number five in the county for number of homeless residents based on last permanent address. I think we pay the highest taxes and we have the lowest amount of funding from the county to help us take care of these individuals. Um, and the reason I bring that up is what we learned from you and what you re reiterated tonight is that in order to gain access to that funding, there's the information gap, which is showing the county the volume and the numbers and who the exact individuals are that we're taking care of because we're, we're taking care of so very many so well, um, which is entering them into this simple system, the, the HIMIS is the acronym, and then to gain access to that, we join the COC. So I am a huge, strong advocate that we join the COC for that reason. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, doctor. Thank you for speaking tonight. Uh, I will say as a, as a new council member, I wasn't that familiar with uh, the continuum of care, but I think it's important to um, ask one question particularly regarding your presentation. I didn't, the one thing I didn't see was veterans. Can you talk about the number of homeless veterans in Summit and who is helping the veterans? Sure, so I, I'd have to look that up. Um, I don't know that offhand. So that's a huge concern of mine, and I will say that um, I'm, I would certainly look towards potentially being in the continuum of care, but not having been on that task force, I certainly have a lot of homework to do and research. I know it's a great organization. Um, can you also explain um, regarding if we did join the continuum of care? Obviously, we are then fortunate enough to receive grants that you just mentioned. Sure. One of the grant potentials I noticed would be new construction. So a new construction building, if we could prove that it was more effective than rehabilitation. Is that something like, what does that mean exactly? Sure, so, so by construction, right, there's, um, right, particularly, you know, there's option, there's option to also align with the COC, but then also even within DCA also. So, you know, um, you'd be able to access, right, through the Division of Housing and Community Resources, right, you'd be able to access, there's a couple hundred million dollars in National Housing Trust Fund, Affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, and other resources there, particularly if you were interested in a small site, um, small voucher-based unit, or something like that. There's definitely, that's something that, it wasn't necessarily um, extensively covered in the presentation, but that would probably be a separate conversation with the Office of Housing Production. Okay, NECA. thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Sure. Have you approached a town that has said they don't want to be be a part of the COC and why? Uh, not yet. I haven't. I haven't um, participated with a municipality that that has said no. Okay. Um, oftentimes, it seems that there might be the perception that oh, this is just going to throw up the signal flare that we're that we're going to be a. Um, you know, a, a, a net attractor, right, for homelessness or something like that, right? That's not the case at all. What, that, what the COC participation does mm -hmm. is it allows you access to what's called 
the annual and supplemental NOFO process, right? So a good case example of this is last year's pit count, right? So last year's pit count was pretty, or point in time count, right, was demonstrative of a pretty stark increase of homelessness here in Summit, right? The pit count goes into the fund, it goes into the funding matrix for COCs, right? So even though there was, there was increased homelessness dollars awarded to Union County based upon the numbers of that pit count, right, when organizations and municipalities and other entities within aren't participating in the COC, they're not necessarily seeing the net benefits of those counts. Does that make sense? They're not, see why wouldn't they see the net benefit? Well, so if you only have one, um, right, so if there's additional dollars that are spent, or say you have a pilot program that you wanna launch using COC funding, mm -hmm. right, through their annual scoring process, right, if you don't have a seat at the table, you can't advocate for what's going on, even though at the county level, the aggregate numbers of unsheltered homelessness are being counted, and that entity is receiving funding based upon the exim population. Okay. So when you talk about a pilot, are you talking about like if we had the affordable um, our housing authority, could we use money towards that? Is that related? Sure. So the the COC and PHA are two separate entities. Okay. Um, right. It's they're both kind of they both receive HUD funding, but it's two different funding streams that okay. they receive. Um, one of the novel, um, mo most recently, there was a special unsheltered homelessness notice of funding open where a PHA would be able to apply for a special type of voucher program. It's called a stability voucher, right? And so those stability vouchers, which many communities in New Jersey went after um, through that unsheltered NOFO process with, in partnerships with PHAs, allowed um, where their two-year time-limited vouchers for persons in order to rapidly exit their homelessness that they can use in concert or without rapid rehousing funding or other funding sources. Okay. And you know, I'm just seeing this for the first time also, so forgive me. What oh, yeah, is, no um, I mean, obviously our goal would be zero, but what is a realistic goal um, for reducing our homelessness? I would say reduction by 25% is very much achievable. You know, and that's just with coordination. I think that if there's a purpose of effort that's strategically engaged and tactically deployed, you know, here within the city that you could go even further in 50 or 60% reduction in unsheltered homelessness in the city. Okay. I don't think that's a reach. All right. And if we join, um, are we able to use the funds on our, the way that we would like to use them? Or is there sort of a... Um, right. So, a, so a the, the process with the COC and the annual funding... Um, <laughs> Right, it's a little more nuanced because there's there's bylaws that are that are unique to each COC. But what's common are, are around all the 16 COCs throughout the state is that notice of funding process, right? And so, if you have a program that you wish to pilot or deploy, right, you create essentially a prospectus of that program, mm -hmm. right? And then during the annual then during the annual notice of funding through HUD, that program you would then submit that program to be scored by the scoring committee of the COC, right? And once that program is evaluated, all the programs are ranked. And there's, there's three tiers of programs, right? Tier one programs are the highest rank, right, which are guaranteed funding, right? Tier two programs are funded if what's, there's called bonus dollars, right? And tier three programs are unfunded unless there's additional funding provided by HUD, okay. right? And so majority of, of entities that are new to COCs, right, are able to pilot pretty new innovative programs and particularly drive traction for programs that were stood up rapidly during COVID, right, in order to kind of demonstrate efficacy. Like you, to be really honest, you have a fantastic model with what you've done with Warm Hearts. That's- With what? With what you've done with Warm Hearts. That's, warm hearts. You've, you've now have two years of, of solid data on that, so. Okay. So the benefit seems to be, through you, Council President, is um, that we join the COC in order to be able to capture, it, we put information into the system, HIMSS, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then we can, in, eff in effect, get money back for helping the homeless. Is this what I'm hearing? Like, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. just, I'm trying to make it as yeah. simple as possible yeah. for everybody so. out yeah, there. So. Yes. <laughs> because, um, yeah. yeah. I think so. I mean, yeah, I mean, my understanding, right, is that, is that we, we have this incredible philanthropic effort going on mm -hmm. in, in Summit. But if, if it's not seen, by the state, and if it's, it, you know, we, we need to get access to funding mm -hmm. for those things, and the way that we do that is engage with these with these systems. The the COC is the way to then get us access to, HIMIS is my understanding, and we can then be registering people 
to make sure that when there is diversionary funding available and we can avoid someone becoming unsheltered in the first place, that seems like there's money available for that, right? When there's, when there's vouchers available, you know, like there, this is, we have to get a sort of accurate understanding of, you know, what, what is the situation that we're facing in Summit? And this seems like the sort of prerequisite steps to doing that to me. If I'm wrong about that, let me know. <laughs> no, I, I think that's, that's pretty on point for okay. a high level understanding. Thank you. So I just want to say, um, Six years ago, when I made some calls down to the county and said, we've got some homeless here, is there any, how can we get some help from you? And, and nothing. Um, so I think that the COC is absolutely the way to go, not just for the opportunities for funding, but for the resources that are available, like the human capital, you know, sharing experiences, talking to other company, other organizations that are doing things, and we can learn from them. I mean, our organizations in Summit have learned from each other. So I think that that's really valuable, not just the funding. Well, of course, the funding is very important. Um, and I just want to point out, um, Council Member Hamlet, that um, we didn't have a task force. We've gotten tripped up sometimes in the past saying we have task forces, and people go, well, who's on the task force? Well, there was not a task force. There were myself and a couple of members of Council met with Dr. Hack Callahan, and we've had some other conversations. And I started this with the Mayor's Forum on Diversity with all the, um, the various stakeholders and formed a working group. So just, just want, didn't want you to, you know, misinterpret that there is no, there has not been a task force. And thank you very much for your um, presentation. Great. Thanks. Other comments from council members? I just had a quick question. Sure. So what will the process, council president, be going forward as far as how will we determine as a council whether or not we will join the COC? Well, uh, I think this is, a, this is a safety, this has been something that's been discussed in the safety committee, and I, I would think it would be their recommendation that we that we do that. Um, and then I don't know, Rosie or Michael, I don't know if we would need a resolution to, to submit our application or not, but uh, I think... I, um, I mean, I will say personally, this is the first time that, I mean, you seem like a wonderful person and you do wonderful things, but I would say I need a few days to digest sure. the information just because it's yeah. just the first time I've ever seen it and I need to do some research. It's kind of like getting yeah. all of Christmas at one time of and course, you just don't know. I don't think okay. anyone's anticipating having a resolution tonight. Okay, perfect. No, no. certainly not no. tonight. That's, not that's tonight. all I was trying to understand. <laughs> not tonight. We just, we, I, I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, our, our state director of homelessness prevention here uh, to explain to us and to the community what's been happening specifically here in Summit. So thank you for that. You. I think mm -hmm. this was the, a very good step to getting us up to speed on what's happening and then we can my hope is that we'll we'll draft some sort of a plan that then will outline some clear and specific steps and we can just do them in order. That would be that would be how I would want to do it. Yeah. Well, I can yeah. clarify what we've done so far. We've spoken about this in safety and the safety committee and the form that we received from the county from the county COC was like a one pager. So I filled it out. It's pretty easy. It's like name, address, phone number. It, kind it of seems stuff. simple. It seems simple. Um, yeah. So I'm a little bit wondering. You mentioned a, you know a plan as well. They didn't call for anything like that. Is that something we could work on in parallel? Oh sure. So submit this so they can start talking to us maybe at once um, once other members of council are comfortable with it. So um, and the other question that I had is you mentioned something. We were thinking that an agency, the city and the police department, were one agency. Is do police departments or law enforcement entities sure. participate separate from? So, so an example of that mm -hmm. would be um, the Atla in Atlantic City, right? Mm -hmm. So Atlantic City's police department participates, mm -hmm. right, under one umbrella, right, with, um, so there's actually four entities that participate in the C at the COC for Atlantic County, and that's from Atlantic City. There's the Atlantic City um, Department of Aging Services, there's a Department of Health Services, there is the Office of Emergency Management, and there's the AC Police Department. So right. you can have separate entities within the same like municipal body? Sure, sure. It's, it's really With dependent. One vote? It, it's really dependent upon what, it's dependent upon your governance structure here. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I, so, so I don't know the specifics of that, so I okay. couldn't. I couldn't really. Oh, we can it. talk about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I was just curious sure. that you seem to make that distinction, and I think there. Sure. It, it, particularly, uh -huh. the reason um, being is that is that there's only one member of the city government that participates on the executive council mm. of the COC, 
right? Versus versus the general body. It's it's much like this body, right? Where where there's you know different delineations mm -hmm. of responsibility and authority. Got it. So. Okay. And can you talk? You also talked a little bit about. Um, how homelessness prevention, and can you go a little more into some of the services that are available well, sure. for that? Right. So um, within right, a good a good example is uh, of that agency in Union County is Proceed. Right. So Proceed has two different grants uh, from my office. One is called the HPRP two program, and that's homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing combined. And what that program does is it allows folks that are at 30% AMI or lower that are at risk of eviction, right, in order to and in order to kind of intervene through that so they don't enter into homelessness. Mm -hmm. right. um, it also allows for payments of uh, so rental arrears. It also allows for payments of uh, utility arrearages and things like that in order to help folks, you know, live comfortable and not have to choose between the lights if they can't pay for it or the rent, right? Similarly, Proceed is the grantee through my office of the state's homelessness prevention program. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Oliver just waived a lot of the criteria for the homelessness prevention program. And that program has more expansive um, income criteria where if you're up to 80% of area median income, you get access to a similar set of services in order, in order to ensure that you either aren't evicted or lose your housing or if you do, right, that you rapidly return to housing. Okay. And proceed is available to residents of Summit? Oh, sure, yeah, right now. Yeah, you don't have to be, you know, you don't okay. have to, right, anywhere, okay. anywhere in the state. Yep. Okay, great. Thank great. you so You're much. Welcome. Okay, Council President, can I ask a quick question? So um, there's a lot of elderly that their mm -hmm. rent goes up significantly, and they potentially could be, um, at risk mm -hmm. for losing their home. Is this something for Proceed or is this, could, could you Oh yeah, sure, I, I would definitely, I would point them that way towards okay. Proceed. All yeah, right. I think, I think that'd be a great match for that. Okay. Um, and then also too, for folks that, um, you know, at DCA we have other voucher programs based upon, um, because we have, we're the largest PHA in the state. Mm -hmm. um, we also have other voucher programs in cases like that where there's multiple comorbidities, right, someone's a senior things like that where we might be able to actually explore an option, especially for folks that are extremely income limited. Okay, and one last question. Who else is part of COC in Union County? Uh, so in Union County, right, we have, I believe the Township of Hillside is joining soon. Okay. Not sure whether, whether that's actually been executed yet. Okay. Pretty much every single nonprofit homelessness provider, mm -hmm. right, um, every grantee of my office, every grantee of DHS, so the Department of, Homeland, of uh, Department of Human Services, Right, um, and there's intermingle. So an example of that would be like Jewish Family Services of Central New Jersey, the Elizabeth Coalition, Proceed, Bridgeway, which is the PATH provider, um, particularly in that program, which I believe there's already an existing relationship here in the city, right? So for folks that have, have a diagnosis of serious mental illness or um, that also have a diagnosis of substance abuse or there's, or, or there's upper long-term developmental disabilities that are, are kind of it causing that person to remain in homelessness, right? Um, that PATH program pays for a way out of homelessness for them. Okay. Great. And then also too, I'll send follow-on materials for Thank all of the Perfect. stuff. That would be, for, that would thanks. be fantastic. Thank you. Um, Yes, hi, welcome. Um, thank you, thank you, and thank you to technology for allowing me to be able to watch this in a car uh, service <laughs> for, via YouTube. So, um, Thank you, Dr. Callahan, for a very thorough presentation. Really excited about learning more about this. Uh, like Council Member Hamlet, I want to ask, uh, sur you know, surprised about not knowing about what's happening with veterans. The other growing population are women with children. Yes, ma'am. And due to job loss, eviction, mm -hmm. absolutely, that's the, my research, uh, my knowledge of the research agrees with that. Eviction is really the key. And so um, uh, can you talk about that population? I, you didn't mention them at all, especially when you were saying older and male. Sure. So, so one of the issues with the demographics of homelessness in Summit is that it's all coming from one provider in HMIS. So it's uh, basically folks coming from Bridges. Okay. Right. So if okay. folks didn't interface with Bridges, they're not being captured at all okay. in the state system. And so that's the reason why the demographics there are limited. I can tell you writ large, um, you know, one of the trends that we're seeing in 2023 versus 2022 data across the state 
are that, um, you know, women, but particularly single mothers, right, are, have, there's a remarkable uptick mm -hmm. in both homelessness being precipitated by eviction, but just general risk of homelessness, yeah. right, for folks versus kind of the year over year, year, over year trends. And what uh, preventions? I heard Council Member oh, sure. Fox mention that. So that's something mm -hmm. that, because um, I always am concerned about the stigma of shame mm -hmm. and women who are involved in divorce and things like that find themselves in these awful circumstances and shame will prevent them from coming uh, forward when they could be helped. And so what, uh, what are some of the uh, features that you can share with us? Uh, so with regards to any systems or anything else that someone's data would be entered into, or I, ju I just need a little. So um, I guess maybe that I'm asking how can we get the word out about what could this population access? Oh, sure, definitely, right? So my office has marketing materials, our department has marketing materials um, at DCA, but then also too, if you want some targeted materials just developed of the existing kind of homelessness prevention services and um, you know the general, the general ecosystem, we could develop something targeted for you too, that's fine. Okay, for so I guess oh, sure. probably the question I should be asking then, we don't have, you currently don't have a means of getting the word out. That is what you're relying on your members, and that's why it would be advantageous for Summit to join and other organizations, other... Uh, so, so importantly, my, I, I'm not the COC. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm from the state. The, okay. the COC is a collaborative entity that exists outside, it's a quasi-governmental entity. Yes. So um, I, I just want to make that distinction is I'm from DCA, I'm not from the COC. Gotcha. Um, my office is a you member. You fund COC. Uh, so we fund, we, we fund um, organizations that participate in the COC, and a prerequisite of our funding is participation. Okay. Um, but without, um, we do not directly fund COCs until probably June of this year, right, in which we will be offering funding to COCs, uh, funding awards to do some data work and data science work with regards to homelessness. So, so we're, we're hearing a little bit of a gap here, so, okay. Right. Opportunity it, for sure. somebody to fill, that's a nonprofit or a, um, a communications gap or, but I, I know we can explore that more yeah. as we look into it for Summit. Yeah. And, and also, too, importantly, um, one of the Lieutenant Governor's uh, key initiatives that just closed and will be awarded soon is the expanded comprehensive eviction diversion and uh, access to counsel initiative, right? Um, that is gonna up the funding for eviction diversion, but also partner legal representation in every vicinage in the state so that resource navigators will be able to be co-embedded in eviction proceedings, mm -hmm. right? And to be able to work with folks, even if the first time they're interfacing with some type of legal, legal or quasi-legal advice is that day, mm -hmm. include access and rapid screening for those programs we just talked about. Um, and so that, that award should be announced probably shortly. Okay. Those are resources that we may want to make available to our rent commission who are interacting with people who mm -hmm. might be yeah. facing eviction. So thank you Great. again. Um, we have a bunch of other things on the business agenda. So I, I want to give the public the opportunity for maybe a quick question of, of Dr. Callahan. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi, Dave. <laughs> David Naidu, 100 West End Avenue. Uh, thank you to Council, the Mayor, for taking on this very important issue. Thank you, Dr. Callahan, for coming in. Uh, your presentation had a lot of information and just trying to absorb it. I think if I got it right, at least one of the slides referred to, I think, 50% of the folks who are homeless, who are being identified as being homeless in Summit were not actually Summit residents. If I got that right, maybe I did get that wrong. Um, but if that is right, then I guess my question to you is, um, the program that you're speaking of, or are there, whether it's this program or other programs that would help to make sure that those who are homeless, but who are not Summit residents, are getting services in their communities from which they are 
coming from, because obviously there's a portion of the population that is coming to Summit, according to your data. And I think, uh, to Councilwoman Allen's question, how many people can you actually address, that goes to the top number of how many people do you really need, or are, you, are Summit residents that you're addressing. So it's whether it's 25% or 50% of 60 or 30 is significant. So if you could address that question, I'd appreciate it. Right, so a good example of what you would be able to access through one of these programs, right, is say for the case of argument, right, say the Elizabeth Coalition was awarded one uh, grant program which is open right now for street outreach in Union County, right, funded through my office, right. If you had somebody who showed up to the summit train station, right, was sheltering there overnight, but then able to, but then it turns out that they're from Irvington, or they have kinfolk that they would be able to shelter with, right, or to, to double up with in Jacksonville, North Carolina, right? The diversion component of that, of that program would be able to pay for a, for a train ticket, a plane ticket, connection, food, and overnight stay, and connection in order to get that person there if that is the most expeditious and aligned with um, diversion, diversion outcome there. Simultaneously, right, say somebody was in New Providence, but they're receiving services here, right? Our services are apportioned by the county, right? So, and also too, they're driven by self-determination of the client. So those are, those are two prerequisites of the programs there. So um, with regards to kind of tracking data and, and looking at writ large, right? Um, so the reason why you also have with that data set from Bridges, right? You have bridges providing services to persons that are summer residents, but then you also have bridges providing services to folks in Western Union County, okay. right? And so when you have regional service providers talking about, and you're talking about the point of service that you're looking at at delivery versus last permanent address, right? Those are two buckets that you'd have to f figure out from a policy perspective what you would want to target with any municipal initiatives or something like that. Okay. Great. Um, okay, uh, I think if there's no more questions on this, um, we're, we have, a, we have a, another presentation and then a number of, of other things. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll move on. Um, and we have, uh, we have a, an update from Michael Coyle, who's the Regional Public Affairs Manager uh, for Somerset and Union Counties for PSE&G. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, Council President, Council me uh, Members. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I'm Mike Coyle, the public, as I said, Mike Coyle, the Public Affairs Manager for PSE&G. I work with the, uh, the municipalities in Somerset and Union County, try to uh, keep, the, keep the peace and keep the relationship uh, solid. So, as you know, we're doing work pretty much everywhere. <laughs> you can't get away from it. There's PSE&G uh, uh, facilities everywhere you turn. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, an update as to what's going on here. So, um, again, this, uh, how do we move on here? We go this way, right? Okay. Um, this forward-looking <laughs> statement, we have to put this in everything we do. I'm not sure exactly why. Any attorneys in the house might know, but I, uh, I certainly don't, but I have to do it. So Everybody got that, right? There's a quiz, <laughs> right? There's a quiz on that. Forward-looking <laughs> statement, I don't know what's in it, but it's, uh, it's got to be there from what they tell me. I don't know. So... Uh, <laughs> As a PSE and G, we're public service electric and gas company, so we provide electric and gas uh, through through uh, the state of New Jersey. Uh, we're the largest uh, utility in the state. Uh, just some just some you know s some stats here on the way. We have about 2.3 million electric customers, 1.9 million gas customers. Um, we have a total uh, rate base investment of about 24.5 billion dollars. Um, you know, combined of distribution side assets, which is what's in the streets to get you the electric and the gas service to your homes, and then the transmission assets, which is what moves the, the highway of electric and gas throughout the state to get it to, to where we need to get it to. Um, on the gas residential, we have 35% of our customers residential. On the electric side, about 56% or commercial and 9% industrial. And on the gas side, about close to 60% of our customers are residential, 37% um, commercial and, and a small portion of industrial. Um, but in Summit, we are the gas provider only. Um, 
JCP&L is your electric provider in, in the city. Uh, we provide gas services only in, in the city of Summit. Uh, just some, some basic information, you know, um, our customer service or emergency contact phone number, uh, you feel free to post this uh, information up on the website or whatever links to the, to, for the residents. 800-436-7734 is, is the number that we give out for all residents, whether you have a billing question or you want to make a, an appliance uh, repair appointment or you, you have an emergency, everything goes through that number and there's various prompts that get you to where you need to go. Um, we do have a, a pretty robust suite of energy efficiency programs that are available to, to residents um, for anything from uh, you know, full scale replacements of HVAC systems in your home or just some lighting upgrades or things like that. And, uh, our website is homeenergy.pseg.com, uh, and if you want, again, if you want to put links up on your site for this type of information. And, uh, and the worry-free appliance service contracts are, for me, it's, it's, it's golden. I have a contract for virtually every, every appliance in my home, and, um, you know, it's, it's a set price per month, and, res and, and you pay it, and, and basically, uh, you know, you make a phone call, and, and the service tech comes out and repairs the, the issue for, uh, for pretty much everything, heater, water heater, refrigerator. Um, we cover all sorts of appliances. Um, the, on the gas side of the house, the, the program that we're, we're focusing on um, for the last few years, it will be over the next several years, is, is our, what we call our GSMP, Gas System Modernization Program. Um, and what that is, is aimed to do is, is basically reduce the methane emissions uh, that are, we're putting into the atmosphere through updating our infrastructure. We have miles and miles and miles of um, old cast iron main in the ground, old spare steel main in the ground, and uh, these things are 60, 70, 80 years old, and unfortunately, over time, they leak. The cast iron isn't as flexible, you get some cold, and the cast iron breaks, or the, the bare steel will, will corrode and, and will rot out and create a, a leak in the pipe. So what we're doing is we're, our, our asset management team has been identifying various locations throughout our state, grids basically, to identify where we have the most leaks, where we have the best opportunity to, to invest in if updating the infrastructure and getting the best results uh, out of that, that infrastructure uh, investment. And after, as, we, as we're working through what we're doing uh, throughout our territory this year in 2023, um, we'll, we're looking to achieve, reduce our methane um, emissions by about 22% from the levels we, we were at in 2018 when we started this, this uh, gas uh, system modernization program. Um, we, we're, we're looking to replace about 875 miles of pipe by the end of this year and um, updating some of our gas metering and regulating stations and installing methane detectors and, and smart metering and all sorts of things like that to be able to um, help us manage the system better um, maintain the system more safely and provide better services to our to our end use customers. Um, through some of the, ben the uh, some of the benefits of the of this the gas uh, system modernization, is we're you know we're updating and modernizing the existing infrastructure and <clears throat> leak re as I said, replacing the leaky old pipes that are in the ground and we and we're using you know modern uh, construction technology. We're in, in a lot of places we can insert a new plastic pipe into an existing cast iron pipe that's in the ground. Um, that, will, that prevents us from having to open up a trench. It doesn't always work, it doesn't happen everywhere, but um, you know, if we have a six inch cast iron vein in the ground and we, want to re we need to replace it, and if, we can, if it's feasible, we can put a four inch plastic pipe through that six inch cast iron pipe and get the, get the new facilities in there and up the, uh, upgrade the pressure in that system as well. Um, we're also installing better gas flow controls as we go through the system to help us operate the system more safely. We can, um, you know, it gives us the ability to, to stop the flow of gas in, in, any, in any part of our system and isolate the flow if we have any sort of uh, situation or incident on the system or, or we have any kind of uh, flooding situations where we potentially could get water into our gas mains. We have the ability through these new controllers to be able to isolate sections of the system. Um, and we're, as I said, we're, we're reducing the leaks and, uh, and preparing our system for some other low carbon uh, alternatives that we're looking to do. We're looking into, um, as part of a, another filing we have before the Board of Public Utilities now, we're looking to go with a renewable natural gas um, uh, 
process. And essentially what that is is uh, methane, recapturing methane from landfills um, or other sources where methane is generated naturally. And those things have been out there for a long time. They haven't been properly tapped or utilized, <coughs> excuse me, but we're, we're looking to find some sources of renewable natural gas where we can, we can recapture methane that's being generated naturally, clean it up, get it to the point where it could be injected into our system and provide additional uh, gas sources for, for our residents and customers. Um, and again, and one of the other, <coughs> excuse me, another alternative, another benefit is the ability to, um, for more higher uh, efficiency equipment. A lot of, most of the older pipes that are in the ground, the cast iron pipes, are, are what we call utilization pressure. They're very, very low pressure. Um, it doesn't allow for the type of technologies that we're seeing in homes and businesses now, the high efficiency technologies. So by upgrading those low pressure pipes to higher pressure systems, it gives us the ability to get more gas through the system and allow residents and end users to utilize those, those uh, technologies, the high efficiency technologies um, at, at a better rate. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Summit now, as, as I think you're probably pretty, uh, pretty aware, we are working in, in various parts of the town and we're, um, I think we're about to move into the, the, the business area or if we have, uh, we have already been there. But our process typically is our, crew, our main crew comes through first. So we'll have several crews. I think we have maybe four or five or six, six, six crews working in Summit um, now. So we'll, the crews will go out there and they'll, they'll install, you know, a couple of hundred feet of main down the road to get a head start. After that couple of hundred feet is put in, service crews will come in behind them and then work to renew the service from the main to the home or the business. Um, so it, it's kind of a continual process. So we're not, we're not installing all the main and then coming back again, you know, three or four months later to the people we had we disrupted already and then putting in services. We're kind of trying to work the process so we get the main in and then shortly thereafter we get the service in. Um, we make temporary restoration in the street, obviously. Um, other part, another part of this program is a requirement from the Board of Public Utilities to move the gas meter outside of the home or business. Uh, many, my house as well, and, and many homes have their gas meter inside the house. The Board of Public Utilities wants us to move those meters outside for safety and um, more easier access um, for, for, you know, for, like, for safety purposes. So we are doing that. PSE&G pays the cost of any relocation, any additional piping that's necessary. So the homeowner has no, no out-of-pocket cost for us to move that meter outside. Um, so we make the temporary restoration, and then about 60 to 90 days later, after we have a settlement period for the temporary restoration, we come through and we do the final restoration of the, of the street um, that we're, we're, we're working on. And at various points through that process, we provide notifications to the residents or the customers. Um, Jean Marie Ryder is here, my, so she's our outreach uh, representative. So she, she was out there today notifying residents, uh, businesses that we'll, of the work we're gonna be doing. We'll notify them at the beginning of the process that something's coming, there's a project coming. We'll notify them maybe six or eight weeks later as, as the project is going on, where we stand with the project and what's happening. Once the project is completed, we'll notify them it's completed, and then as we move to the restoration phase, we'll back out and say we'll notice them again. You know, the, the, rest, the road restoration is coming, and, and we'll be restoring your street to, uh, you know, back to its normal condition. So we, at various points through the process, we're notifying the residents or the businesses uh, along the way as to what's happening. We have... I, I, we have a website. Can we um, have you just step one yeah. step closer to the mic? Oh, uh, sorry. Okay. We're getting reports that people can't. Oh, I'm hear sorry. I Thank thought you. I was talking about. I apologize. Okay. Thank so you. we do have a, a website for every gas project that we uh, that we're undertaking, and the the is the, uh, kind of a long address, but this is the this is the link for the address to the work that's going on in Summit, and this this website identifies all the streets that we're currently working on the streets that we're gonna be moving to to work on in the future and the streets that we've completed. Um, it contains uh, some information regarding restoration as well, but it, it, it generally kind of lags a little bit by the time we get the information 
from our gas crews and the work that's being done and we get it to our IT department and IT goes through what they have to do to update the website. So it generally lags a week or two behind where we actually are with the construction process. <laughs> Sorry, but it's kind of useless. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Well, it's, it's the best we can do. Uh, I, I, I um, so just, I mean, it, this is a little bit of an eye test, and the next slide will be even worse. But these are some of the roads that have, have we've, these are the roads that we've completed and paved in town uh, to this point. Um, we have, we've, we've completed another host of roads, um, and they're ready for, for final restoration. Um, there's two, actually two slides of, of, of those. Two slides of roads that are completed and ready. And um, we'll be looking to, to start road uh, final restoration on these roads probably sometime in May. Um, I know, uh, Council President, one of your issues is make sure, making sure the roads get restored properly by utility companies. And I know Aaron will not let me fall down on that. So we will, uh, we will work closely with Aaron's office to make sure that we, we know exactly what we need to do and we, we restore the roads to the, the city's uh, satisfaction. And then the roads that we're currently working on now, um, which we most likely, the schedule for, for completion of these roads is sometime in June. <clears throat> so, you know, Canoebrook Parkway, Highland Morris, Springfield Ave, uh, these roads are all under construction now. And <clears throat> at various points between now and June, some of these will be con completed, but the, the final re completion date for anything within this, this roads that are currently under construction would be out sometime into the middle of June. So with weather delays and things like that, I would say probably the end of June, we will have all these roads completed and you know, be into our, our temporary restoration period. And then once we get our 60 to 90 day settlement, look to pave these roads uh, in the fall before the winter. Um, <clears throat> there are, excuse me, there are a couple of additional um, grids that we were, were looking to work in town before the end of the year. Um, there's about 12,000 feet of main that we're, we're looking to replace. Um, along Morris, Broad Street, Morris Turnpike, Walnut, that's just a couple of the streets that I, I picked off the list. Um, and again, we will be, once we have that, that whole plan laid out with time frames and a couple of, a couple of these larger jobs will be, will be contracted out to, uh, to contractors. So once we have those contractors um, in place, we'll meet with, uh, again, we'll meet with the uh, Aaron's office and make sure we, we lay it all out and everybody understands what we're going to be working on. And the same process will be followed with this work. You know, we'll notify beforehand, we'll do the mains, we'll do the services, and we'll keep notifying as we move through that process um, until, we get, until we get to completion. Um, that's that's uh, the information I have for you tonight. I, um, I pr again, I appreciate the opportunity. So if anybody has questions, or I'm, I'm sure there are questions, uh, yeah. if. Uh, well, thank you. So I, I'll, I'll start us off with two things. So first, uh, to give some credit to Council Member Lisa Allen and the Administrative Committee um, for having the idea to invite you uh, back, and that uh, second, to acknowledge the good timing of this visit. Uh, it was communicated with city staff that uh, the work going on uh, would reach our downtown around mm -hmm. this time right. and that it would take several weeks. Yes. Uh, now we know it'll take much longer than that. Um, so I think I speak for everyone on the dais that we understand the need uh, to do this critical infrastructure work, mm -hmm. um, but we want to, one, make sure that it's minimally, as minimally disruptive as possible, yes. uh, two, complete it as quickly as possible, That's and right. then third, that the roads are repaired as quickly yes. as possible. So um, I, I I think you know that. Um, okay. But I, I do want to um, open it up to questions on, uh, from council members first. Um, I, it's, can I just, in relation yeah, to the sure. as the least disruptive as possible, we are working some of the in downtown area at night. So yes. we're trying to you know, stay out during the day, knowing what goes on and, and work it at yeah. night. So yeah. you know, it, it's still disruptive, but it's yeah. less disruptive than doing it from eight in the morning to five, <laughs> five at that's, night. So. That's appreciated. Yes. That's appreciated. Okay. I think I'm sorry, you know, a big, the, the, yeah, this, there's the, the big things, you know, mm -hmm. the three big things. Um, wh where do we have a question first? Andy first. Yes. Quick question. Thank you for that presentation. Um, the temporary restoration period, 60 to 90 days, mm -hmm. I know, is that so that the road, the temp thing can settle a little Correct. bit? Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, what is, that's a navigable road during that. That's what we're seeing on Morris, kind of Correct. further down toward uh, New Providence area. Right. Um, 
So that means that during that 60 to 90 days, it is still a drivable road. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. And we, we do that because, you know, you, you try, you don't want to, you don't want to restore it and then do a final paving and then have that trench sink because, yep. it, and then, so that's what we do. We do it 60 to 90 day settlement period to let that temporary settle in properly. And then we come back and mill and pave and, and do the final. Okay. Thank you. So um, thank you for this presentation. I, one of my questions is how do you notify um, residents and businesses because my road has been under um, construction for a while now and I never received a notification. I obviously, I signed up for the city notification so I got it that way but I didn't get anything from PSE&G. Uh, we, uh, we do it several different ways. Jim, do you want to speak for that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jim can, can speak. We do, okay. we, we do phone calls and, and door hangers. And stuff. They do a door hanger normally when they first start the project so you might have got a door hanger way before they actually got on your road. And then what they do is every two months you should be getting something in the mail. Something that we did recently identify on our end as well. Do you, are you served with gas by PSENG to your house? Yes. So sometimes the address in the thing pops up differently. We're looking into some of those. That is something I found in the past. But you should be getting something in the mail about every two months as well as an email and a phone notification. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question I had is, is there any effort to clean up sort of in the interim? So like a lot of the roads have been open with trenches and there's just a lot of dirt and yes. gravel and mess. And now what I'm hearing is some of these roads that I thought, oh, as soon as it gets warm, they're gonna be paved and we're now hearing maybe not till the fall. Can, is there some effort to go through and clean up and not leave messes on everyone's streets and lawns and everything else. Uh, we, we, work, we work with our contractors as best we can to get them to, to clean up and, and not leave the messes. But if there are, are, are specific roads or specific places where you have issues, please let, you know, let me know and we'll, we'll get our contractors back out there to, uh, to take care and of it and address do, it. How do we notify you? Is that... I have, can I have some cards here? We I will post this on the card. city's <laughs> website. I would refer also to the hotline number, which I can give you. It um, oh, it was up there. Yeah, 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 I'll read it to you. Actually, the one that was on there, I wouldn't suggest for anything related to the gas work. Um, the number that he's passing around right now, and I'll say it out loud for anyone yeah, else you can who read needs it. it. Yeah. Yes. It's one 661 6300 so you can then call and say, my street's a mess and there's gravel and that mess on my That is the best number. Lawn. If you call the other number, they're going to send you to that number. So I'd, I'd call that number primarily. It'll actually lead to me. Okay. So as soon as I answer it, I forward it on to our gas supervisors. So, okay, And that's great. within one business day. We get back to you guys. So. Okay. And then the other question I had was Morris Avenue. I assume we're talking about the part um, from River Road that you're talking about that, that is going to be completed this summer. Right. And um, is there any way that that can be accelerated because, and, and paved during the summer because of, um, you know, we've got a lot of schools on mm -hmm. that road and a lot of traffic and it's really, okay. really disruptive. And folks have been dealing with New Jersey American Water disrupting it um, even before that. Uh, the people who rely on that part of Morris Avenue have been suffering so for, you know. Morris between Norwood and Kent Place, would that be? That would be Kent Place School, um, but but it goes all the way down. down to it River goes Road. all the way down to River Road. There, okay. right. so the point is, we've got Washington School, we've got the high school, okay. we've got all, we've got Kent Place, we've got Oratory. We have four schools in that stretch. Um, okay, it's a mess. Okay, we can. We'll take that back to our gas department and let them know, you know, your concern and, and see if we can accelerate that and, and move it up and okay. get it done Thank sooner you. rather than later. Yeah, okay. I think if that could be done during the summer, so at least we don't go into the fall. Right. With a you know with a mess and a paving project, and just that that eight hundred number that Jean Marie mentioned, all the notifications that we do, whether it's a door hanger, a letter, uh, sometimes we do phone calls. All of those notification methods reflect that number. Uh, mm -hmm. So residents, if they're paying attention to the to the notice that they're getting, should have that number. And and if you get phone calls, I know you know maybe Michael gets calls into his office or Aaron gets some more. If you end up oh, getting calls, we all get them. Yeah. <laughs> Give them that number. <laughs> okay. okay. Don't, I always try to say, don't get yourself in the middle of the of the the mess. Give them that number, and and you know we'll then take it from there. Okay. Thank we you. Get, we get phone calls, texts, carrier pigeons. We get we get everything. Hate uh, hate mail. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> And, uh, I've first of all, a few thank of those. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Thank you for your presentation. And I'm sure. sorry I laughed. I apologize. That's okay. Um, so the gas meters outside. I mean, I recognize that it's been happening on the, on the homes, mm -hmm. 
for a long time, and I, mine's outside now. Right. Um, but in the downtown, my understanding was that the gas meters were not going to be on the outside of the buildings in the downtown because we've got a beautiful downtown. And yeah, and, and so in a situation like that, they they would not put them outside in front of the building. They right. might they might put them outside in the back of the building, okay. or maybe on a side alley or something. But they wouldn't they wouldn't put them in front of the in front of the building on the street. Great. Okay. Yeah. And then um, we have a pretty robust communications office. So would it be possible? I understand it's it's hard to, you know, you get, get you have to send out crews to hang the door hangers, and mm -hmm. you know it's 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 kind of complicated. But would it be possible for you, Jean Marie, to send um, a notice or an email to our communications? That's one person, and and she is an assistant. Um, that she could then shoot it out to the community. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. And we send out. May I have your email address? Yeah. That'd be great, and yeah. then she can push that out. Yeah, it's very good. That's great. Great. Yeah, Thank Jean -Marie you. Jean-Marie sends out a, uh, an email every Friday as to you know what the schedule is and where the crews are going to be. So we can add her to that list, and it'll be uh, make it easy. That's great. She would like that. I, I think she's probably watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. And this is where we make a plug for signing up for notifications. That's right. If you want to find sign up for notifications, yes, Nixle, notifications. Nixle notification please or? do that. And, yes. and the city notifications. Okay, city you notifications. Know, it's the best way okay. to get information. You don't have to check the website. Right. It's, as soon yep. as she puts something out, it immediately hits your email box. That's yeah. great. Or your text. So, okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate you coming and, and all of your information. I think we need to, my, my suggestion would be to take a serious look at any work that we do past August, mm -hmm. because if we can't pave that road, then you have residents who are getting work done in August and their roads aren't being paved until right. the following May or June. Right. So what I'd like to see up there, and I listen to, I listen to residents every day, and it's, I, I would rather spend more time with my family than dealing with PSENG's issues, to be quite honestly, um, to be quite honest. <laughs> but I mean, I had a resident the other day where the crew, I, maybe it was a contracted crew, but how do you hold the contracted crew accountable? When we have a contracted crew in the city, I would hope that Aaron goes and inspects the work and makes sure there's not trash all over somebody's yard. But how do you hold the contractors accountable and how are we going to avoid this next year? I mean, there's not bullets flying. These gas lines need to be replaced, but right. do we need to start work on somebody's house in August when they're not going to get the road paved until May? Uh, if that's a concern, we can, I mean, we can certainly look to, to, I can talk to the guest department about postponing that work um, and, you know, not starting it until I just think it's a conversation. I think it's a really important conversation because now that I'm learning that the asphalt plants are closed and I've had to explain this to 5,000 million residents and I'm talking to Aaron about it every day, let's look at the timeline. Maybe we don't need to do it in August okay. and September because we can't pave till May. Uh, we, we, I mean, our hope is that we would get that, if we started that work in July or August, we'd get it done in a couple of months and we'd be able to pave by, you know, late October, November, before, before the winter. But uh, I understand your concern. And we Not can, happening. I can, I can talk to the, the gas department and see if we can postpone that work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Jamie. Um, my, my quick. Um, I just want to emphasize a point that Council <coughs> person Fox made. Sometimes the debris, the asphalt, migrates onto lawns mm -hmm. of residents, and that's been a common complaint I've been hearing recently. Now that spring cleanups are happening, right. and it's spraying, and the gardeners and landscapers are out there trying to maintain lawns, and they can't because of the asphalt on the grass. Right. So just to you know, make sure that that's common practice for crew to check not just the roads, but also the lawns. Yes, okay. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. You have to come. Can we can we have you just come up? Because the people watching at home yeah, yeah, yeah. can't hear. Sorry. New Jersey American Water. Um, I did check water. in with our supervisor, and he said that Morris Avenue is scheduled to be done around mid next week. So paved. that D one done. What do you mean? Not All paved. I'm, no. I apologize, but installing the main. Okay. So yeah. so, so then in 60 theory, to 90 days till. Well, so it won't be it won't be paved. But the, I'm saying if but if there is be able to get it, but you should be able to get it paved before. Fall. Yeah, that should be able to be paved yeah. this year. Yeah. But well, not this year, but before the fall. Right. So is what yeah, I'm. Yeah, sixty to ninety days, <laughs> end of March. That that seems reasonable. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you could make that a priority. I I, I will send that. Yes. Yeah, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. To our paving coordinator. Okay. I just have a quick yeah. question. Yeah. Um, you gave us a phone number for people to call, but is there a website address? Is that the same one there, or just for people who might use a website uh, that they can put it's in it's there? PSEG.com. Okay. Is the, is the you know the the website. Um, Okay. And you can, all the things you can do by calling that 800 number, the 436-7734, you can, you can do 
on the on going to the website. Okay. So I, I was referring to the eight six six number oh, okay, for the when the street. If somebody wants to um, report a street, is you know there's debris in the street. Is there? Is yeah. There a yeah, we, we also have an email inbox. Um, I don't want to give you the wrong one, so just give me uh, one second fine. to check my paper. I, I believe it's like gasworks at psing.com. I'm like 90% sure, but let me double check. I'll get back to you no in one worries. moment. Um, and then the only recommendation I would make is um, on the front of an envelope when it goes out, I would put open me. We're doing road work on okay. your street. That would be my recommendation because I don't read my mail very often. So yeah, and, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I get I get P S E and G letterhead up in the, you know in the corner in the return side all the time. And you know, if I don't know that it's something I want to look at, then maybe I don't look at it. You're right. So okay, we maybe we need to take that back and see if we can do something better to make it a little more attractive to for people make people open it. Yeah, through you, Council President, uh, they are these green and white obscure door hangers that usually don't make it to the door, um, and they aren't, um, they are not eye-catching, and I don't know what the language is, so I can agree it would be a great service to take a look at those. It's usually some kind of like, I'll say, like a, a folder, like a little, you know, like a, it looks like, a, when it's folded over, it looks like a business size envelope. And inside it is is the letter, um, and then it usually has some kind of attachment where they you know, put it around the door, or sometimes they put it on a front gate if somebody has a, a you know a gate in front of their home, a fence or something. Um, so it's you know we can't put it in the mailbox because of postal regulations, right. but uh, mm -hmm. we try to get it you know as to the door or as close as we can to the house so people see it. Okay. okay. Councilor, I just want to say one more thing, yep. um, because next month we have New Jersey water coming as well. So I think just to Councilwoman Hamlet's um, uh, concern, you know, obviously timing matters. So I don't know if you have to rip up an, a street in August and you absolutely will get to it in November, mm -hmm. but there's other considerations too, because there's New Jersey water. So um, I don't know how you partner with them, if that's more through... I don't know exactly how it's done, but I know that our asset management team that identifies the work that we're looking to do works with New, Jer you know, New Jersey American Water or whoever the water company is to find out what their asset management team is looking at to try to, to work together. So that, uh, and we, we've done that successfully in many locations where you know, one of us will open the street and somebody will decide that they're going you know, to do the final restoration to cover both, both trenches. Thank you for coming yeah. tonight. Can I pleasure. add something to that yes, statement? Um, also, I know um, uh, Aaron Schrager actually does a lot of that on behalf of Summit. Um, I know he just recently shared with our committee that he received the scope of work from New Jersey American Water, what they plan to do while the roads are open. So Aaron is on it. Good. Good. Great. Um, anything else from up here? Anything else from us? Yeah, I was, I was just going to confirm that that email address is gasworks, so G-A-S-W-O-R-K-S, -S, at PSEG.com. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, and our, our communications office uh, will we'll get this information over to them, uh, and they will get it out tomorrow, I hope. Um, okay. Anything else from council members? No? Uh, we at, we're at 9 o'clock. Uh, we do have a full business agenda, but do we have any questions or comments from the community on, on this? Come on up. I just have one quick question. Um, on my street, the main has now... Can you come on, come on up to the... Uh, and Bonnie, I'm sorry, your name and... Bonnie Morrison, thank you. Rotary Drive 24. Um, on our street, the gas main has been installed. We're now waiting for the connections. And one of my neighbors, we have, um, I know you, you end up digging in the front yards. One of my neighbors, it's actually gonna be in their driveway that's gonna have a hole dug. And I was curious about the restoration process as far as uh, temporary patching like they have, like we have in the street. And then is there going to be a final restoration where they have a more comprehensive paving of their driveway? I, I have to say I don't know on that one. Um, most of the time the services are, are in the grass area, not in the, in the driveway. So uh, what was it? Can you give me the address again? Uh, the address of the house would be 30 Rotary Drive. 
Rotary? Yeah. Can you just make a note and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll talk, we'll, yeah, Jean Marie can follow up and find out what the, what the plan is for that one. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you for being you. here. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, I think those were both very good conversations. Um, okay, we're going to move on. We're going to keep going. Uh, we're going to move on to our ordinances for hearing. Um, we have one that we're continuing from March 7th, so I'll ask the clerk to please read the ordinance. Yes, ordinance number 23-3275, an ordinance amending the code, chapter seven traffic, section 7-11.2, stop intersections designated. Okay, and council member Fox. Thank you, council president. Um, so this ordinance will amend the city code to make Prospect Street, Blackburn Road intersection a four-way stop with the addition of stop signs on the Prospect, on the prospect Street side. Um, this four-way stop is intended to reduce motor vehicle crashes and enhance pedestrian safety. Um, some of the supporting information on this ordinance was omitted from the agenda packet last, at the last meeting, so council moved to continue the hearing to this meeting. So um, uh, I just wanted to also just quickly note what the, um, the origin of this um, this measure is. So in 2019, we received a request from um, a a, n a member of the neighborhood who had um, said that they thought a four-way stop here would be helpful in terms of uh, pedestrian safety. Our police chief at the time, um, Bob Weck, agreed with that. Um, a study was undertaken. Oh, well, actually, the study didn't wasn't undertaken because after that was received, um, COVID hit, and a study couldn't be undertaken because there was basically not a reliable traffic pattern for um, for a couple of years. So once traffic went back to normal, a study was done. And so that's the, the information that's been added to the packet is that study so people can see that. So at this point, um, I move to continue. Uh, I move to continue the hearing. Open the hearing. Open the hearing. Open the hearing. Open the hearing. Excellent. Sorry. And I seconded. Okay. So uh, the hearing is open. I want to start uh, with a couple of things. So I grew up, I grew up in town. Uh, for years, we had councils and staff members that did not want to put stop signs or flashing beacons around town. Uh, whether it was the idea that we it would, it would be this slippery slope and we would have to put them everywhere, or whether it was the idea that uh, there, was, there was a high cost associated, or whether it was the idea that uh, it would look too busy and not like Summit. Uh, or a combination of these things, they didn't happen for a while. So in 2016, after the master plan revision was drafted, an emphasis was placed on connectivity uh, and pedestrian and traffic safety. So 2018, council adopted the stop sign policy. 2019, council adopted the sidewalk installation and maintenance policy. People on council and city staff started to recognize the reality of the situation, which is that we live in a place where a lot of people walk around and drive around. And certainly since the pandemic, we've experienced completely unacceptable entitled behavior from people behind the wheel of cars that are getting bigger and bigger. If you're hit with an SUV, you're more likely to wind up underneath the car than on top of the hood like you would if you were hit with a smaller car. So council and city staff and neighbors for the last several years uh, have decided to engage with these pedestrian and uh, traffic safety measures and the three E's, right? Education, enforcement, and engineering. On the engineering front, we don't need to have a stop sign or something on every corner, but we have a set of federal policies and standards, the MUTCD, and based on the warrants listed therein, uh, we can investigate where we could install these kinds of measures to upgrade safety, and then budget permitting, we can do so. So I remember in safety committee, uh, when I was chair in 2019, uh, with our former police chief, Bob Weck, uh, we, we decided we should look into this intersection. It might be a good fit uh, for a stop sign. Uh, safety and health committee commissioned a traffic study, reviewed the relevant data, and turns out Chief Weck and the neighbors uh, that submitted the complaint were right. It meets the requirements, and safety and health committee is now recommending this course of action to the rest of council. So to me, there's enough pedestrian activity there, more than 200 people walking, uh, that it makes perfect sense to install this. So I support the ordinance, and I just wanted to start with that. So 
I will open up to the rest of the hearing. Council members. Nobody? I, I can go. Okay. 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 Uh, sure. I have to go to the podium, though, because I want to pull something up on Google Maps. Is that okay? Uh, okay. Do you, well, do you want to just have Aaron? Do you want to do Google Maps? Sure. Is that what yeah. you want to do? Yeah. Could you just pull up, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Aaron, the, nope. the sidewalk plan, if you just Google City of Summit Prospect Sidewalk Plan, and then if you could pull up 77 Prospect on Google Maps. Uh, while Aaron is pulling that up, the one thing I would like to add to Greg's uh, council president's history lesson, uh, obviously you know a lot of information about this, but the one thing I, I will say is that what I've learned in um, speaking with uh, dynamic traffic this week uh, that I didn't know is that about 10 years ago, uh, New Jersey Department of Transportation actually gave up that right to oversee uh, the regulation of installing stop signs, which actually gave uh, the council uh, and the city of Summit a little more um, recourse or a little more investigation when it comes to stop signs and it really is uh, an engineer's at the engineer's discretion. Um, the one thing I would ask council president, was it under Bartolotti or WEC? Uh, well, because this conversation I, first started in 2019 about Because this. I believe it was Bartolotti. So, so no? 2019 we started this conversation and uh, about this intersection. Okay. And then of course, because we couldn't do traffic studies during the pandemic because nobody was driving I mean, it doesn't really matter. Right. I, was just trying, why, I was trying to find the actual residents who requested it, and I couldn't find so anybody. Okay. Okay. Chief Bartolotti was not a chief until 2020. Right. Okay, maybe it was. I just wasn't, I wasn't able to find the actual resident who requested this, and I've been looking. So if anybody finds it, and I asked Marjorie as well. But you have the name, right? No. It was the gentleman who was sitting in the front row at the last meeting. Um, I don't, I don't recall his okay. name. You asked me if I had the actual request, and I do not. Okay. Um, okay. What, uh, sorry, can you doing? pull up the prospect plan, Director Schrager? Oh. Prospect sidewalk plan? All right, that, that's different. I thought yeah, we were getting Google Maps. Um, or Google Maps, either one. I just need them both pulled up at some point. Um, well, I can just continue with what I was, was going to say. Uh, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with this topic, I have spoken to our city engineer, dynamic traffic, summit police. In addition, I've spoken to several neighbors in that area um, and spent countless hours on this study. In fact, I think I might know it better than dynamic traffic at this point, um, <laughs> which is sad. Um, my main concerns are that we are simply moving too fast on this one. I think we need to slow the process down and regroup uh, like I said before, there aren't bullets flying. I don't really think there's any reason to make this decision tonight. Uh, some of these residents have lived there for over 30 years. I have to respect their concerns. Uh, I would also like to hear more from the people who want the four-way. For, for the memo dated on January 4th from Summit PD to our engineering department stated a draft ordinance has been created, has been created to reduce vehicle crashes and enhance pedestrian safety. So two goals, reduce crashes and enhanced pedestrian safety. I then asked myself, what are we actually solving then? First, we have, we've had two crashes in the last five years. It wasn't enough to meet criteria B. The second part is to enhance pedestrian safety. How will this enhance safety without a crossing guard? I spoke to several neighbors today and many feel right in that direct area that you're looking at right there that many people will become even bolder as they travel eastbound on Blackburn because many people right now are making that, they're coming down Blackburn and they're not stopping at the stop sign to go right on Prospect. If you can see the one resident there, it's 77 Prospect. The reason why his driveway is so important, um, he has a family that he had, they, that, that family has um, some younger children with some, they, they certainly have to be very careful. The one thing that I've been thinking about is if we put that stop sign on, it's going to be virtually impossible for him 
uh, and his family to back out of that driveway. And he's almost gotten hit several, several times. So I take that piece of the safety piece of this very, very seriously as he's the one that is impacted the most uh, by this stop sign. So there's a couple questions that I have. One has already been addressed. One has already been addressed, which is I haven't really been able to obtain the exact uh, resident who requested this, and as Ms. Fox mentioned, she might be able to track down that information or we might know who it is now. Uh, second, this study clearly concludes that a stop sign can be placed, but should it be? There are a few things going on in this neighborhood directly outside of Oak Knoll. What is the plan at Oak Knoll? There were some community discussions of a parking garage. Is that happening? The sidewalk improvement plan is about to begin on prospect. This will start to connect the current sidewalks in a more cohesive manner and connect the crosswalks. This is why I wanted to bring up this visual for all of you because a lot of the, some of the newer residents have concerns that they actually can't get across that street and a lot of that will be solved by the sidewalk that's coming in. Fifth, did we notify all of the residents? A lot of the residents have been telling me that they haven't been notified. Now they were obviously notified from the meeting that we had. The good news is, as a result of the study, we have learned a few things. Sight lines. We now realize that sight lines in many instances are something that needs to be addressed. I have spoken with many of the residents that have agreed that they will cut back their bushes now that this has become a topic of safety and concern. Why don't we start there? Let's ask the neighbors to cut the trees and the brush back. I think you will find that they will comply. Enforce parking. Knowing what I know now and speaking with so many residents, I have encouraged parking services to enforce more of those four and two hour meetings. As I spoke with Director McNanny, lately we have not had the staff to enforce those areas. So that is another good thing that I've learned out of this process. The other thing that we have learned since we've put, if anybody has noticed, we've put the orange cones out on Blackburn and Prospect. That has significantly impacted the sight line and people shouldn't have been parking there anyway. Um, now, it wasn't really a great indication of the last couple of weeks because Oak Knoll was off of school. So I think that, I think it's gonna get better. I think we're gonna enforce parking. I think we need to have the police. You know, I spoke with Sergeant Daly today and I, I'm not against the stop sign at all. I'm all about safety as everybody here knows. Uh, I just think it's a very, a much more broad conversation around what's going on at Oak Knoll, what's going on with the sidewalks, let's engage the neighbors, they've lived there forever. Let's hear from some more residents who want it. Let's just take a pause. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just say, uh, I think three, there's absolutely no world in which three years is too fast. I think, <laughs> I think that this, is, this started in 2019. We, I, I'm lucky. We just did the traffic study. I think I'm lucky that we're still on council and we're doing it, I, that I'm still on council and we're finally doing it now. You know, I mean, this is, this is like, really a long process. I also, I also think we're three months in to 2023 and we've had the same number of people hit by cars in crosswalks in that amount of time. So I submit that we can't be outraged about that and also not take steps that are easily available to us to make pedestrian and traffic safety a priority. So that's my, not my thinking, but I think other, yes, Marjorie. Um, I, I'm a little confused, Councilmember Hamlet, because I, I know you're very, as uh, Chair of Safety, I hear often from you with um, your observations on things that you believe are unsafe, and I, I appreciate those emails, and I appreciate the information that you're giving us, but here's an opportunity where we can actually, you know, we have a study that says it will be safer, it will improve, safe, you know, the service at the traffic service as well, and it will improve pedestrian safety, particularly for people who are trying to cross prospect. I drove it today, and even with no cars there, it is really hard to see if you're coming from Springfield across and trying to cross prospect on Blackburn. Um, and, you know, and this will at least, you know, coming from the east, the cars coming from the east, I couldn't see. I had to pull all the way into the into the crosswalk in order to see. That's not ideal when you've got kids crossing. I just, I'm puzzled about why we have an opportunity to make something safer and, and you're, you're shying away from it. And I'd really like to understand. Sure. No problem. Well, actually, when I spoke with the police department today, 
I did not have uh, a very good level of confidence that we, um, and I guess we could speak, I'm not sure whose role it is to really, you know, somebody sell me on the traffic study, whether it's Director Schrager or the police department. We just had, the traffic study was just done on December 8th. December 8th. So we haven't really been doing anything for three years. We just did a traffic study. I mean, that's... that's we, couldn't, we couldn't do for quite a while. Right. I'm, I'm not we against... The, I'm not, I just want to make it clear. I'm not against the stop sign. I'm against the process. Again, it's about the process. Okay, so why don't you explain to us what the process is? And, and let me just clarify one thing, Ms. Ms. Uh, Council Member Hamlet. This is not a, you know, a... Um, you know, a, a survey of who wants what in the neighborhood. When we deal with safety, it's not about, you know, whether it's popular or not popular to do something. If we have, a, a, if we have, you know, it doesn't really matter who brought the, the request, what the other people in the neighborhood might prefer. If we're getting, if we have a traffic study that says this will make this intersection safer, it's our job to do that. Then where's the documentation? Where's the documentation? That's, I, that's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see the stuff that's been written in and it hasn't been safe. And so maybe, Director Schrager, I can ask you some specific questions on the traffic study. Would that be okay? You, uh, through you, Council President, you can, I did not prepare this study, but I'm, I'm happy as an engineer to, to offer um, the information I can to the best of my ability. Okay. Yeah. Well, do you want to give us your thoughts on the traffic study? Uh, well, so I, I could start back a little bit, so. Um, most of these, and, and first, just to start, um, just for one clarification, because it did come up in conversation today. Uh, Four-way stop, all-way stop, multi-way stop, it's the same thing. Um, you could have three-way intersections, which just complicates it, but I see it's used interchangeably here and just throughout, so it is, it is stopping all legs of this, which is a four-way intersection right here, so just to preface it um, with that. Engineering or police or public works, we do not install stop signs because it's fun, because we're bored. Uh, the process is they're requested, they are investigated, they're warranted, and then it's brought before this governing body to ultimately make the decision if, if we proceed. Uh, some of them don't even make it that far because it's not warranted, and we can do the study in-house because it's quick and easy. Uh, some of them require more detail because they don't meet those instant war uh, warrants right away, such as crashes. Crashes is an easy one when you have 10 crashes. That's a quick fix. Uh, we don't need to undertake a study to get volume um, because you hit it right away. Uh, on this one here specifically, which Dynamic had uh, completed, uh, there are some things that they highlight that, that you know, speak, um, I don't want to say volumes because they refer to volumes, but some do literally speak volumes, but 212 pedestrians crossing on December 8th, that is a lot more than zero. Um, that is a significant number uh, right there. Uh, site distances, um, some could be corrected, but, but it's voluntary. We don't have a means to enforce uh, the site triangles at, at this intersection right I'm now. I'm sorry, Aaron, isn't that uh, from city ordinance? Uh, the city ordinance that was provided by, uh, through email today from a, a resident, Dory Gagnon, uh, was for new development. So okay. that, that does not have any impact for what we do proactively. Uh, we do have a draft ordinance in the works for such measures. Uh, it has not been uh, adopted or even introduced at this time. So we don't have any ordinances on sight lines at all? N not for um, residential for crosswalks? properties. So for crosswalks or stop signs? No. So, yeah. Interesting. Okay. So those are some of the, the key elements that are highlighted um, in, in this study. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just have a couple of yeah. questions. So I guess my questions are, and you're the expert, so... Yeah. If we didn't meet criteria, if we didn't meet criteria A, we didn't meet criteria B, right? I was confused why the pedestrian information wasn't located on the major roadway, Prospect Street, Table 1. You can see it if you dig deeper on page, and trust me, I'm not trying to hold you to the spot here. I just, I'm a mom looking at a traffic study. Um, but the information for pedestrians wasn't included in table one, but then you had to cherry pick it out of pages, uh, off of page 23. So I was just curious why the pedestrian information wasn't included in that table on the left. I, I called dynamic traffic today, but they were close. So Aaron, you, di you didn't prepare this report, right? So you have, no, you have no yes. way of answering that question, right? 
No, I, I mean the, the table I'm reviewing, just, just from looking at it, page five does have a pedestrian volume table. I'm not but if you look sure at 14, there's no, so it says minor roadway black burn, vehicular and pedestrian volume. So it includes vehicles and pedestrians, but then the major road doesn't include pedestrians. But that leads me to my other question, which I meant to call you today and ask you, but what's the original reason that the stop sign wasn't on prospect to begin with? Does anybody know that? Because that's the major road. Isn't that, how does that work? That's, that predates me. There, there would be an ordinance. I, I live on Blackburn that, Place but, yeah. and I've, since 1989 and that stop sign has been there since right. then, so I have no idea. But I, it was actually something that Dynamic Traffic brought up. He said the one thing that he found was interesting was that the stop sign has actually never been on prospect, which I thought was very interesting. I don't know the answer, but I thought I'd bring it up because that's the information I had. Um, but the real thing that I'm really confused about is um, if you look on page 13, the minimum volumes, the minimum volumes. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, it's engineer's discretion, right? Because if you just meet, you don't have to meet A, B, or C, you just have to meet some of the additional criteria. Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's just my opinion. I think we could spend more time and listen to the residents, but yeah. I'm not trying to be combative. I just think we should do more work, and there aren't bullets flying. We could wait another day on this one. That's just my thoughts. I'd like to comment on the, oh, sorry. Okay. Through you, yep. Council President. Yep. Just on the last point um, that was just made um, regarding how many criteria were met on these traffic study. What I've learned from reading quite a number of these um, in my time volunteering for the city is that so rarely when we're looking at an engineering intervention to make us um, an intersection safer, so rarely are, is every box checked of criteria. The reason why, if so, that intersection would be so glaringly unsafe that it would already have this measure installed and would be so obvious. So what I find, and, and my first few times reading these types of studies, I thought, gosh, that's so subtle, that so feels diminutive, and then when you read the MUTC, which elaborates on the necessary criteria, you realize that um, driving is so dangerous and being a pedestrian in a street is so dangerous that really the subtlety required for some of these is so much smaller than you would think. So I just wanted to make that comment. Can I make a comment? So do you think we should put a crossing guard or a beacon there as well? I'm not a traffic engineer or a policeman. Again, so and I'm that's why I think this is... qualified to make that decision. But that's why I think this is a larger conversation. Right. Perhaps we but should get Chief Zagorski up here and talk about Lieutenant Daly looking at... Uh, Sergeant Daly looking at the traffic study. I just think it would be good to have all, all opinions. Okay. Other, other comments from council members? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, I'm conflicted on this because I live in the neighborhood too and I actually have experienced some near misses. So I am a proponent for the, the um, stop sign um, because as you come up Blackburn Road to Oak Knoll, um, it is a little bit blind. Um, there are some things that are getting that are going to be done where um, there's going to be traffic enforcement, so it creates less blind spots. Um, I think we're going to go to zoning potentially to cut back some of those um, bushes that are there, which is good. Um, so I like the idea. I think there's a couple things that have surfaced for me um, that have put a little bit of doubt into my mind um, that that I think is important just to note is um, one, Prospect Street, they're having the sidewalk put in. So I feel like it also could kind of alleviate some of that pressure of the pedestrians crossing over there. Two, um, I think we have Pine Grove Bridge. It's gonna be on the um, docket to be fixed at some point. I'm hoping by next year, because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. really in bad shape. <laughs> and, um, and if it's closed, you can make a, an either or argument, right? Um, it's going to drive, if Pine Grove Bridge closes, it could drive traffic up Prospect Street. And how are we gonna manage Prospect Street sidewalk going in with a bridge also being constructed? Um, you know, so what really was actually bothersome to me um, was um, when I drove by tonight, what I realized is the driveway literally um, is 
where the stop sign would go. So if I was backing out of my driveway, there would literally be a stop sign right there. So people will be stopping, and at the height of um, school, right, that 15 minutes there and back, um, it would be really difficult for someone to get out of a driveway. So um, I'm not against a, I, a, the stop sign, but I would want to just take another look for you, like have you go and take another look and say, is this um, feasible? I don't think any of us on this dais would want a stop sign literally at the edge of our driveway. That's just my opinion. So, go, um, Jonah. Through you, council president, how many neighborhoods in Summit ha have stop signs on the corner where their houses? It's not an uncommon. No, so it's at the driveway, not at the corner. It's the driveway is right. Um, I don't know if you can pull it up on Google Maps. That's if you Google it, it actually is, shows it to you. Yeah. It shows it on Google Maps. Well, I guess I'm not. Um, I'm not making the connection between a an absolute. Um, and, and I know it was diminutive, perhaps, but something that has uh, clearly uh, been proven by the requirements uh, both federal and local, why I'm not making that connection with a, a, how a stop sign would prevent one family from being able to get out. It's right at the end of the driveway. Can I so I just I just want to say, I am absolutely for putting a stop sign here. Good. I just I'm hoping that tonight we can understand that the location of the stop sign is a little bit more complicated because there is a drive when you pull out of the driveway. When I drove by the house tonight, because I live the over alternative? there. And the alternative? I don't know. I think we should. I think we should. My personal opinion is if we could not vote on it tonight, have him go review it and look at where the driveway is relative to the stop sign. Um, is that a motion, I, well, I, I don't, I'm just having a conversation. I don't know what you would uh, want to do. You can't, uh, we you can't do it. We're, we're in a hearing. The table while we're having the hearing, right? You can. Okay. You can well, during the hearing. So Should maybe you guys can just take a look at where the driveway is, where the stop sign would be, and I think that would be helpful. I'm sorry. Okay. So. Can I just ask a question about the driveway? Yeah. So, um, Aaron, how would this work without a stop sign? I would think it would be hard for, for this family to pull out of their driveway with traffic going up and down prospect. They might actually have an easier time with a, with a stop sign there. It, it's, it's possible, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Really, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm just, it so, seems to me that's not really the issue. And, you know, the issue is safety in... Okay, okay, can I, I'm well, sorry. I actually you're, spoke, you're with, I spoke oh. with Ralph at 77 today, and he, he um, the one thing he mentioned, um, Council Member Fox, is that he inches out as it is now, and he'd be happy to cut his bushes back. The reason he keeps his bushes higher is actually so everybody else will slow down. And I said, well, will you cut your bushes down? And he said, yes, but one of the reasons he keeps them up now is just so people actually start to slow down. His concern with putting the stop sign right there is as the cars begin to back up, he'll never be able to get out of his driveway. And again, I'm not against the stop sign. I just think that it's worth having a conversation between engineering and Sergeant Daly while they're both here and we can have everybody with an educated opinion and perhaps even the residents and make a decision then. I'm sorry, can I just finish my statement? Yep. Okay. So. Um, I also want to say, if it is safety that we're worried about, what I'm also concerned about is um, it seems as though we want the pedestrians to get through the crosswalk safely first. That's like the number one when you look at this, this study. What will happen is, is um, you're going to create another, I, I don't even know where you would put that um, crosswalk relative to the driveway because if he comes out of the driveway, you, uh, you couldn't safely come out of that driveway without potentially hitting a pedestrian. So that's a, that's a safety thing. That's Two, my other concern is about crossing guards. We can't hide, we've had the conversation, it's really hard to get crossing guards. So I was like, you're gonna create a, a stop sign, right? And then you'll create a crosswalk. What's gonna happen is there's four cars all coming to a stop during the height of a 15 minute drop off for school. 
kids without a crossing guard are going to walk into that crosswalk and it is a little confusing. So I just, I, like, I would almost say, if you're gonna do this, I, we would have to commit to hiring a crossing guard in order to get kids, because there's sight issues with bushes. Like, I think this is a little bit more complicated. The site, so as the kids coming up on the left side, as you're on Blackburn Road going over Prospect towards Oak Knoll, there's bushes here. And so there's four cars stopped and a kid's coming behind the bush and steps in without a crossing, into the street without a crossing guard. Now you have someone coming out of their driveway trying to back up and go into traffic. I actually think from a safety perspective, I would love for you just to say, you know what, we'll just take another look, make sure this is the right decision. Because I'm like, I would take down the other stop sign, put an LPR over there, put a crossing guard, and that's really what's gonna keep pedestrians safe. But I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm just as a mom. But um, so I, again, I would definitely support a, a stop sign. I just hope we can just relook at this. That I'm just making so, that. So first of all, I don't think we want to make passage of this ordinance conditional upon hiring staff. I don't think we want to do that. Secondly, uh, it's not to say it's prohibitive either. We could certainly add a, st add a crossing guard later, right? Still having a crossing, uh, still having a stop sign there. That's something we do all the time. So. I think we want to separate those two things. Um, are there more comments from members of council? Can I ask a clarifying question? Oh, sure. did you want to go first? Well, the only thing I just wanted to say that if you look at table three, the multi-way stop criteria, okay, it's very clear we didn't meet A, B, and C, right? We're all in agreement. We didn't meet A, B, and C. That's fine. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. We're all in agreement. Everybody's looked at the study, correct? I'm not asking personally, but everybody's actually read the study. Okay. So we didn't meet uh, the first one in the additional criteria. We met the second one, which was B. The third one, from what I understand, there are no ordinances in place. Or there's, so there's no way to have a resident be held accountable for bushes that are too high? No, oh. not in those corners, no. Yeah. That's okay. correct. Um, So the other one is D. Prospect and Blackburn are both local streets carrying a similar total volume of traffic and have a similar design operating conditions in a residential setting. Here's where it gets interesting. Blackburn Road, the minor road, but with the stop sign already, was observed to experience higher volume during all hours of the 12 hour, 12 hour MTM counts with the exception of one hour. So it seems like we could fix C if he cuts down his bushes. So then we've really only met it from one criteria, which is pedestrians. So there's clearly pedestrians. But to Ms. Allen's comment, perhaps we need a beacon or a crossing guard as well because this is a really tricky intersection. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm. Any more comments from council? We just I have a question. Okay. Oh, yeah. We got it, Jamie first, please. Real, it'll be really quick. I'm just reading your memo that was in this agenda packet. Thank you for preparing it. Um, I guess my question maybe is for Rosie. So just the language says, in conjunction with the engineering and the Summit Police Department Traffic Bureau, the following ordinance has been drafted and then the ordinance comes next. So implicit in this memo is um, that the Summit Police Department supports and thinks we should place a stop sign at this uh, four-way stop at this intersection? Well, well, I don't know. Anyone can answer that. I but would defer to Marjorie. Yeah. Uh, Marjorie? Well, um, well, I could certainly say we talked about it in safety oh. and but the information we got from Chief Sigorski, and if he'd like to speak to that, that would be great. But my recollection was that you recommended it. Mm -hmm. So so my point is, is the way I read this preparing for today was that um, this had already been recommended by the, the police department and the traffic bureau, that we have our, our engineer, um, our police department traffic bureau, uh, both recommending this and saying we should place a four-way stop here. So my question is, are we second guessing their expertise and their recommendation? Yes. 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 That so is for, exactly for, what it's worth, for what it's worth, I also read it that way. Okay. So, yes. Um, has, has anybody asked the police department if they've read the traffic study? Through asking. you, Council President, yeah. may I repeat what Council Fox said? In the safety committee, we discuss it with the police chief. It has gone through both the traffic department and the engineering department. 
It has gone through. It hasn't, Susan. It hasn't. It has not gone through the police department. It hasn't. It hasn't. The in traffic department has did not. not read the traffic so, study. I'm sorry. If the based, chief, uh, based on what? Based on my conversation with the traffic department. Th with the whole traffic department. I will just say with the traffic department. Okay. I, you know, I, I think we right. just need more time okay. on this. I don't want to well, make right. a big deal. I think just trust me. I think we're, we're getting away from the, the topic. Okay. So, so let's. One last question. Yeah. Is it possible just to pull up the picture of the driveway and have Chief Sikorsky comment on it? Chief, would Is you? Is he here? I can't see. Um, yeah, so Aaron, can, can you just explain where the driveway is? I think this is a really, real, the only reason I'm bringing this up is I drove by tonight and I, and I am not questioning safety because I would put a stop sign on every corner if I could. So this is not about not doing this. I just, I want to look at this with the public, or, you know, us, and you can see to the right where the driveway is and where that tiny little bit of grass comes out. Where are you going, can you show me where the um, crosswalk is actually gonna be able to go and where you would put the stop sign? Where someone is not gonna, it's not gonna be right into that driveway. No, no, I, I, the, I need the actual visual. Oh. Um, that you had. Sorry. Right Council there. President, Google Maps uses a 360 degree camera that's like really distorted. So using this as, a, as, a, as an official way to determine whether a stop sign can go there is a little premature. Well, I, okay. it, you That's can see the driveway. I mean, this is basically what it looks like. Can you zoom in? I, Google I think, Maps well, well, doesn't dis it distort. It's, it's also going to be impossible for us to see in, in any kind of realistic view what the width of a sidewalk actually looks like right now. We, we could imagine it. No, no, this, right. this is this driveway where the um, stop sign it would go. So I'm just asking where the crosswalk would go. That's all. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can share that on this distorted, potentially, um, strip of land, there would be a, a ADA ramp, <laughs> right. the stop bar. Looking like the other one. The crosswalk yeah. uh, and the stop sign itself. That is what's proposed in this area. Okay. How it plays out relative to the Google map, um, you know, it is, it is shown... Um, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a mouse person, I don't, but, but it's this intersection here, I'd like to zoom in a little bit, but, um, yep. I don't know how to do that, but, um, oh, there we go. So it winds up, and this is a scaled drawing, so it does, it does detail everything that's going in there, um, shown on a, a, a topographical survey that was performed. Can you show where the driveway is? Yeah, so this, this gray area here is the existing driveway. Where? Uh, everything in orange is proposed sidewalk. Um, and then the, uh, everything else is highlighted, obviously, the, the crosswalks and the stop bar. Um. May, I, may I get I, up and point to it? Sure. Yeah. So, Aaron, you have a laser pointer there. 77. Hmm? I think so. They're is it laser? Back out into this, here's the stop no. sign, right at the edge of their driveway, Councilwoman Harrison. And this is the walkway. So, because they'll never be able to back out this way, right? They'll always back out that way. And there's cars here. So I just, I feel like if pedestrian safety is what we're after, I just, I just, I don't know. I just thought that, that we should, consider that. That's all. Three Council President? Yes. Uh, conjecture is driving a lot of the arguments from this. I would like to propose that with a stop sign being added there, this resident can now stop and then easily back into his driveway. In fact, start <laughs> installing a stop sign here helps him do that in a safer way. Wait, how are you, how are you explaining? <laughs> so right now there is no stop sign and he to back into his driveway, he would be backing in oncoming traffic. With a stop sign there, he can now back into his driveway and easily leave anytime he wants to he without having back, to back into a crosswalk. He can't back in because there's a crosswalk there, and if he hits a pedestrian as he's backing in. No, he's on this, the driveway's on this side of the crosswalk. Okay, so, so, all right. 
I think we need to give the public the opportunity to talk now about this hearing. This is a public hearing on this. Uh, so anybody in the community want to weigh in on this? Hi there. My name is Isabel Rogers, and I live at 92 Prospect Street. I have two young kids, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I am constantly walking my oldest down to preschool. I commute in and out of the city. My husband and I ride bikes up and down. My vote here is that there is, outside of the two 15-minute times a day, there is no issue at all. If anything, there are studies that show that four-way traffic actually don't change behaviors, and in the beginning of inserting those, cause more accidents and cause more confusion. So my vote here, or my suggestion here, is that we take a moment, knowing that these sidewalks are going in, that will prevent people from having to switch constantly back and forth through Prospect when there's not a side, uh, crosswalk currently that exists, right, like halfway through, as you guys could see on the previous, halfway through roads back and forth. And also, there is a large issue here and I would like to look at the study, because I'm sorry, I don't have all the access to the study, but if I could get a copy of that. But Oak Knoll constantly is parking on those streets. That is the majority of issues <coughs> with cars and people jutting out constantly. With the, and we got something in the mail saying that Oak Knoll is looking to do a parking lot. I would like to follow up and find out when that construction is happening and if it is happening. And then therefore, that traffic is then shot down to the lower entrance of Oak Knoll. So in my personal opinion, I would appreciate it if we could hold off and see how once these new sidewalks are put in, what that does. And also the two, and I just have a clarifying question, I don't know if anyone can answer this, but the issues, right, like two crashes in five years, does anybody know what the crashes at the four-way stop sign at the end of Prospect and Tulip are? What are those crashes? Is that more often than that? Because I believe they are. So I am nervous, in all honesty, to put a four-way stop sign there because everyone is used to the current behavior, then change it and have more confusion with stop signs. If we could look into that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Can I counsel? counsel so, take a one sec. so first, the traffic study is included in the council packet, which is on the website, so you can, you can see that uh, in our agenda that's posted now. Um, second, enforcement of the existing parking ordinances is obviously a key component. And part of that is that the cones are out there now. Um, enforcement of parking is ongoing. Um, and then, I think that was it. Uh, and then I don't have the, I don't have the numbers on, on uh, but we can look that up uh, on the third thing. We can look that up. Uh, Thanks. I think that would be like a really good analysis to see basically what it, the potential accidents would happen with that four-way stop sign versus the non-existing four-way stop sign. And the, the parking, because I live on Blackburn Police, mm -hmm. the parking on um, uh, Blackburn Road has, uh, Prospect and Blackburn Road has significant, they've been aware of it and it's way down. I mean, I'm, I drive past there probably six times a day. Yeah, and I mean, today it was a parking lot outside of my house. A 92. Mm -hmm. I'm right there, I'm just one house in from this stop sign. Not from and, and prospect. As far I mean, I know things are circulating in the neighborhood, but nothing has been submitted to the construction office from Oak Knoll about a parking structure. Okay. The, yeah, they yeah, they reached I, out to all I, neighbors I, asking. I know, and and you know, I, I think I think there's a long way to go there, <laughs> if they would want it. Well, and that's fine. You know, but yeah. can we enforce parking on the street there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, I think that was one of the things. That there have been some good things that have come out of this. We've learned that we need to trim the bushes. We've learned that the cones are working. We've learned that we need to enforce the parking better. So these are all good things. I don't think this is all bad. I think that you coming up here today is very brave, and, and I want to hear from all of the residents. And you know, I think it's a really important topic. Okay. Other comments from the public? I feel like we're going to close the hearing on this, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hearings closed. So, so no way to table. we have now we're going on to ordinances for final consideration. We have one. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you read this one? Ordinance number 23-3275, an ordinance amending the code, Chapter 7, Traffic, Section 7-11.2, Stop Section, Intersections Designated. Okay. And Councilmember Fox, please. 
Thank you, Council President. Um, having held a public hearing at both the March 7th meeting and this evening, I move this ordinance for final consideration. Do we have a and second? I second it. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Okay, we will take a roll call vote on this. Ms. Allen? Nay. Ms. Fox? Aye. Ms. Harrison? Aye. Ms. Hamlet? Nay. Dr. Levine? Aye. Mr. Miniger? Aye. President Fortan? Aye. Okay, that motion carries. Thank you. Uh, okay, we now have ordinances for introduction. Madam Clerk, would you please read the first from finance? ID number 10249, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriations limits and to establish a cap bank. Okay, Council Member Miniger. Thank you, Council President. This is an ordinance that allows the city to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and establish a cap bank. State law establishes two limits to what a city can increase in their budgets, uh, two caps basically. On the revenue side of the budget, property tax increases are limited to 2% over the prior year's tax levy. And on the expenses side of the budget, appropriations increases are limited to 3.5% over the prior year's appropriations. This ordinance deals with that appropriations limit. It allows for an increase of appropriations up to that limit, and then any difference between the actual final appropriations amount and that 3.5% increase amount will still be able to utilize, we will still be able to utilize in the event of unforeseen circumstances because we will be banking that. No actual money is sitting in a bank, uh, but we are reserving that leftover appropriations increase amount for an unexpected future need, up to two budget years. We are not planning to exceed this cap. This is just an important city step that, takes, uh, that we take every year, giving us that extra appropriations wiggle room should we ever need it. I move to introduce this ordinance. I second. Okay. Thank you. And we will have a hearing on that. Uh, on April 4th. On April 4th. Okay, so. Roll call. Roll call, please. Ms. Allen. Aye. Ms. Fox. Aye. Ms. Harrison? Aye. Ms. Hamlet? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Mr. Miniger? Aye. President Vartan? Aye. Okay, that motion carries. And we have another ordinance for introduction. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please read that one? ID number 10110, an ordinance amending the code, Chapter 7, Traffic, Section 7 25, Regulations for the Movement and the Parking of Traffic on Municipal Property and Board of Education Property. Subsection 7-25.4, Regulations. Okay, Council Member Hamlet. Uh, yes, ID number 10110, Ordinance, as um, the City Clerk said, amending the code, uh, Chapter 7, Traffic, Section 7-25, Regulations for the Movement and Parking of Traffic on Municipal Property and Board of Education Property, uh, Subsection uh, 7-25. Four regulations, which adds Juneteenth to the parking holiday. I'd like to move this ordinance. Okay. And I, and I second. Okay. And the hearing on that one will be also on the 4th of April. And we'll have a roll call vote on that one, please. Ms. Allen? Aye. Ms. Fox? Aye. Ms. Harrison? Aye. Ms. Hamlet? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Mr. Miniger? Aye. President Vartan? Aye. Okay. That motion carries as well. We're moving right along to resolutions. Uh, we have one from Law and Labor. Council Member Harris. Thank you, Council President. Uh, ID number 10248, a certification of compliance with US EOC enforcement guidance on the consideration of arrest and conviction records in employment decisions under the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This resolution uh, from uh, the city is to familiarize themselves, the council, with the contents of the above referenced enforcement guidance and the local unit's hiring practices as they pertain to consideration of an individual's criminal history as evidenced in a group, in, uh, a group affidavit form. This is a uh, compliance uh, requirement that we undergo annually. Uh, the uh, federal government requires that we certify that our uh, uh, employment practices review uh, arrest and conviction records annually 
that uh, we follow these guidelines and uh, we heard from our city clerk and our uh, administrator that uh, this has happened and all of our council members have received uh, this um, guidance. And uh, so I introduce ID 10248 for uh, approval. Okay, do we have a second? I second, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that Resolution is adopted. Okay, uh, moving on to finance, Council Member Menninger. Thank you, Council President. This is number 10271, and this resolution authorizes emergency temporary appropriations for the municipal operating budget. The statutory language required in a resolution like this uses the word emergency, but this is a regular occurrence, not an emergency. These temporary appropriations are to help fund city operating expenses and payroll expenses until we have adopted our 2023 budget later this spring. I move to adopt this resolution. I second. Okay, and uh, I should have been asking for comments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> comments uh, from members of council on this one. Comments from members of the public. Okay, we're gonna do a roll call vote on this one, please. Yes, Ms. Allen? Aye. Ms. Fox? Aye. Ms. Harrison? Aye. Ms. Hamlet? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Mr. Miniger? Aye. President Vartan? Aye. Okay, number two, finance. Thank you, Council President. This is number 10276, and this resolution authorizes the sale of the short-term notes associated with Summit's portion of phases two through four of the Joint Meetings Facilities Flood Mitigation Project. This project ensures that this critical component of our infrastructure is ready for major storm systems of the future. The City has, over the course of several past Council meetings, given the authority to appropriate so much portion of that project of which 90% will be paid back by FEMA. Now we're giving uh, the authority to provide the sale, for the sale, of those short-term notes. I move to adopt this resolution. I second. Okay, any comments from members of council? <clears throat> comments from members of the public? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, thank you. Finance number three, council member Bennett. Thank you, council president. This is number 10264, and this resolution authorizes the execution of an agreement with WorldPay LLC to handle all of the city's credit card processing fees. If you haven't read much about uh, interchange fees or assessment fees uh, or payment processing fees involved with credit card payments, it's, it's riveting. Um, <laughs> WorldPay handles payment processing fees, and that's, the, that's really the only one part of that fee uh, set that is negotiable. WorldPay is not just the preferred merchant service provider for the city's current bank, Citizens Bank, but has provided an agreement which our city's CFO, Tammy Baldwin, has projected will save Summit an estimated $110,000 per year over our current merchant services provider, a projected savings that surpassed that of the other two competitors the city also considered. Uh, this is a really great place to save the city some money. I move to adopt this resolution. And do we have a second? Oh, second. Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking about world pay. Sorry. <laughs> um, see, we start talking about credit card mm. fees and we lose yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, but really, seriously, uh, Tammy, this is incredible. This is fantastic. Um, and I know it was a ton, a ton of work to evaluate. So thank you for doing that. Uh, comments from members of council? I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, through you, Council President, perhaps, Tammy, we were going back and forth on a few things today, but can you just explain, does, is WorldPay, number one, are we going to have a dedicated rep with WorldPay? Um, that was one of the, I was actually at a conference with some former WorldPay um, people literally just yesterday, and one of the things that we were discussing was the importance of having a dedicated rep. Through you, Council President. Yes. Um, yes, right now we have, um, because they are the preferred <coughs> provider for Citizens Bank, which just acquired investors, which was our banking facility, um, we do have a dedicated representative there, Michael Casey. Um, that may change to a team as we have more accounts come on with more credit card payments available online to residents as we work through that with other fees. Um, but right now he'll be our dedicated rep. Um, we already have one account in parking where we do use WorldPay um, for permits online. Um, the user wouldn't recognize what, which one we're using, um, so there would be no difference in the other uh, methods of payment. Um, 
but we are using them and it's working out really well. Um, and really the criteria was looking at the savings that they could provide and the ease of use. So what so. percentage of our city platforms now will be on WorldPay? Um, so right now... Or not percentage, are there ones that aren't and aren't? So, so right now um, there are four different um, parking vehicles where we take, you know, different mm -hmm. areas where we take on credit cards. Um, so those will all be world pay with this transition. This resolution does allow us to move forward with the other departments. The um, city clerk's office is looking, the health department is looking to take some of their licensing um, online as well, and world pay has committed to the same fee structure. So, so a lot of times what you'll get is a fee structure where the volume determines mm -hmm. your pricing. So why we may have a less volume over in the clerk's office than we do obviously at a parking kiosk, you know, around DeForest mm -hmm. or something. Um, they have committed to keeping the same rates for us with all the credit card platforms mm -hmm. that we'll use in different departments. What about recreation? Um, so right rec now, World Pay is the user you're going through Authnet as the gateway, and then World Pay is on the other end of DCP. Got it. So it's just an API, basically. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay. Other council member comments? Comments from members of the public? Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. I appreciate what you guys do. Um, as someone who sold things at a distance or we never saw the customer, we only did it by credit cards, um, this discussion usually has a huge paragraph about data security. So I'll just, I know it's late, but yes. can you just say topic, what you've done in that area? Because any breach dwarfs any savings. Yes, and, and, and I'm Will, saying this you, to protect you. Can you just give us our uh, your name and, and address? I, please? I apologize. Will von Klemperer, 156 Colonial Road. Thank you, uh, Tammy or Michael, right for cybersecurity. Thank you. Through you, Council President, I can address a piece of this. Um, there may be further information that either our technology or Michael Rogers could provide but you do go through PCI compliance and you have to do it annually when you're dealing with these uh, credit card services. Um, one thing that WorldPay did recommend um, at this point in time, it's a little bit, um, the cost of it is a bit much, um, but they're all recommending that you move towards the chip readers, but we have 72 machines out there and to move them all to chip readers, it was something like, and that wasn't WorldPay's price, that was, T2, which runs the kiosks, something like $4,200 a machine. So that's something down the line um, that we could look into, but that would be a capital investment. Um, but there is PCA compliant, PCI compliance that you need to go through annually when you first sign on with the payment processor and then annually to keep that up. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, other uh, comments from members of the public? All right, uh, I think we're ready on this one. Um, and just a note, we're missing Councilmember Allen. I think she went. Yes. Uh, she ran out for a second. Uh, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, this motion is approved as well. Okay, uh, moving on to safety and health resolutions. Councilmember Fox. Thank you, Council President. Um, safety number one is resolution 10272. This resolution authorizes the purchase and installation of the IT and station alerting systems for the new fire headquarters. Um, and it's through the Bergen County Cooperative Pricing System. The total cost of purchase and installation is $64,125. $64, and um, I commend uh, Chief Evers for, um, for doing it this way instead of putting it as part of our um, entire firehouse project because that way we avoid the markup of going through someone you know, through our contractor, and we're able to do this and manage it in-house for probably a 30% savings. So um, so with that, I move this resolution. I second it. That's excellent. Um, okay. Any comments from members of council? Comments from members of the public? Okay. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the motion carries. Number two, Council Member Fox. Thank you, Council President. Um, this is uh, Resolution 10259. As discussed in closed session, this resolution uh, confirms the appointment of a probationary firefighter, Nicholas Papa, to fill the vacancy caused by firefighter Scott Mallon's retirement. Um, Mr. Papa currently serves as a volunteer firefighter in Summit, and um, the Safety Committee met with him earlier this evening, and we were very impressed with him. Um, he, and he will be, uh, pending this vote, he will be sworn in tomorrow at 4 o'clock? Right. At the firehouse. Yes. Okay. So I uh, enthusiastically move this resolution. And I second. Okay. Any comments from members of council? Comments from members of the public? New firefighter? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And seeing none, congratulations, young man. All right. Uh, safety and health number three. Thank you, uh, Council President. This is resolution 10267, and as disclosed, discussed in closed session, this resolution declares a vacancy for a police officer as a result of the resignation of Officer Billy Graham, who has taken a job with the state police. Uh, we wish him luck, and I move this resolution. I second it. Okay. Any comments from members of council? Comments from members of the public? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. On to capital projects and community services. Council Member Levine. Thank you, Council President. Resolution number 10126 awards a contract to SNL Contractors LLC for the Wildwood Lane and Oxbow Lane Improvement Project in the amount of $462,810.50. SNL has completed various capital improvement projects around the city in satisfactory manner over the past decade, including the Huntley Road Improvements Project. The work included as part of this project is repair and installation of curbs, drainage upgrades, sanitary sewer upgrades, and the milling and paving of the entire length of Wildwood Lane and Oxbow Lane. I move to adopt this resolution. I second it. Okay, any comments from members of council? I just had one question. Yep. Uh, sorry, I just, the one question I had, uh, Council Member Levine, if you could, if you want to pull up the bid or maybe Director Schrager. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of things in the bid that I've been noticing that are things that like signs. So on this one, it was particularly the street signs, the manhole mm -hmm. covers, the bike um, safe grate. And I was just curious why we can't reuse those. Through you, Council President. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically, and you mentioned a few, sorry if I miss any, but um, the bicycle safe grates, that's the grates on the storm drains so mm -hmm. a bike tire doesn't go through it. Uh, we do and we will, or at a minimum, we'll scrap it and get money back. Typically, um, and on this street, it's, it doesn't meet any code, so it has to go. Okay. Um, but that's actually, when you see just a grate, that is a savings, because it means we're not replacing the whole structure itself. Okay. But we do always try to um, reuse those when we can. Uh, signs, most of your signs that are older than 10 years don't meet the current standards. They have to be very retro-reflective, as they call it. Um, so that's why there was in there. I believe you mentioned one other, and I'm sorry. Just the manhole. I, I was just, I was just so curious. It's the same it's, thing with yeah. the manhole, okay. too. We, we, we try to reuse whenever we can, or at minimum, scrap it. Um, but this street, especially, it's very old infrastructure over mm -hmm. there. So uh, this is a, a yeah. very important and, and good project. All right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Other comments? Comments from members of the public? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. Number two. Thank you, Council President. Resolution number 10244 allows our engineering division to submit a grant to Union County to complete the Mount Vernon and Ken Place Boulevard sidewalk and pedestrian safety project. Union, grant, Union County Infrastructure and Municipal Aid Grant Program provides matching grants to municipal governments in Union County for assistance in stimulating the development of public projects of economic, social, transportation, and governmental importance to the local municipalities. In fact, our city has been awarded a total of $737,000 collectively from this program in the past. The design for this capital project has been completed, and a meeting with the neighborhood was held. 
The project will soon be out to bid in anticipation of late summer construction. And this meets all of the county's requirements that the project is ready to go. The project specifically will extend the sidewalk network on the north side of Mount Vernon and Kemp Place Boulevard to, to Passaic River Road. Additionally, it will realign the intersection of New Providence Avenue and Mount Vernon Avenue for traffic calming and to permit the installation of a crosswalk to service the transfer station property, which will also have a pedestrian activated flashing beacon. The project will also include some minor uh, drainage upgrades that were identified during meetings with the neighborhood. I move to adopt this resolution. I second. Okay, uh, council member comments. Comments from members of the public? All right, uh, I think this is a great project. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we're applying for this grant. Uh, let's vote, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Number three, please. Thank you, Council President. As discussed in closed session, resolution number 10261 serves to declare a vacancy in the Department of Community Services in the Roads Unit. This individual has resigned, creating a vacancy. I move to adopt this resolution. I second. Okay, any comments from members of council? Comments from members of the public? I think we're looking for a CDL driver, if you know anybody. Mm -hmm. Check out the city website. Uh, all right, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Okay, final one. Thank you, Council President. As discussed in closed session, resolution number 10275 fills a vacancy on the Recycling Advisory Committee Commission as the educational representative, Maria Rommel, uh, to fill this position. She is a seventh grade science teacher here in the middle school and is head of the Eco Club there. She has the right qualifications for this position and we thank her for volunteering. I move to adopt this resolution. I second. Okay, any comments from members of council? Comments from members of the public? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Welcome aboard, Ms. Rommel. All right, moving on, community programs and parking services. Council Member Hamm. Uh, yes, this is resolution, thank you, Council President. This is resolution ID 10257, uh, authorizing the grant application submission of the 2023 AARP Community Challenge Grant Program and execution of the grant agreement, whereas the AARP Community Challenge Program supports community projects that improve the quality of life for people of all ages, whereas the City of Summit seeks to provide enhanced services for seniors at the Summit Community Center. Uh, the City of Summit wishes to request funding from the AARP Community Challenge Program in the amount not to exceed $12,000. I move to adopt this resolution. And I second. Okay. Any comments from members of council? I had a question. Yes. Um, is this related to the, um, the Silver Summit um, AARP um, program? There was, a, there was a program that Silver Summit did, basically... I, I, talking about, you know, a scene, I think it was like a senior friendly community. Right, I should have explained that I have, um, was just blanked on it, but yes, yeah, so what this actually is and what I should have shared with you. Um, this is actually from what, uh, hopefully you've seen the teens teaching tech to seniors at the community center, and I should have explained that, I apologize, it's been a long day. Um, but this grant will provide more technology for that program, so we'll have more carts, laptops, things to have the teens. Uh, it's really been a successful program and this will actually be the first time that we've been applying for this grant. So we're very excited to hopefully get that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the update. And uh, speaking of tech, I'm assuming I'm not the only one here. <laughs> uh, the, uh, we, we, we have had our system upgrade uh, uh, in council chambers. It's and in it process. Seems like it's, it's in, in process. process, so we're having, we're having some growing pains. We're not done yet. Uh, but. Just wanted to confirm, first of all, I wasn't losing my mind, and also that uh, that uh, we do hear it as well. And uh, if that's happening, if that's affecting the YouTube, uh, we'll we'll check that out. Um, yeah, they've been working every day here. Yeah, yeah. So um, should be completed in the next uh, month. Week or so. so. Okay. A couple of weeks. Perfect. Um, okay. Where are we? Uh, comment. More comments from members of council. None. Comments from members of the public. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
All right, that motion carries. We're on to our consent agenda. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Uh, can we pull a few things out from the finance agenda? Uh, sure. I just had a couple of questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, can we get a motion and then a second? And then we can ask, ask the questions, right? Yes. So, so moved. moved. Second. And a second? Okay. And now we can chat. Okay. Uh, just a couple. Sorry. The one question I had is the easy pass violations. I was just curious why we get the easy pass violations. And um, that was, it was like 50, 50, 50, 50, like the violations. Which, I was just uh, curious what which, they were. Which bill list is it? It's, um, uh, it is line. I mean, I, I don't know why I'm asking. Sorry, it's. Uh, I don't know why I'm asking. Like I'm gonna know. It's in public works. <laughs> it's you know, in, I don't know why I'm asking. Like I'm gonna on, have the answer. It's uh, on page Tammy, one hundred and one. It's on page one hundred one in the packet. <laughs> Anything? For you, Council President, I would have to pull the purchase order to look at the plates as to what vehicles are. Okay. I honestly just, don't. We got know eight why. violations, and then the next day we paid the bill. But I just it doesn't really make sense to me because. I will definitely pull the purchase order and see. We don't send until you all approve the bills list. No checks are sent out. So I'll certainly look at that tomorrow. Can I ask a question for just my own? Does it make sense to approve the bill list after we have this consent agenda approved? Because I feel like sometimes we have questions and I'm not really sure how to ask them. Uh, we, we just have a, a motion and a second. So we're, we haven't approved anything yet. Right, but no, I mean um, like when we sign the bill list in the closed session. Um, so, uh, Rosie, I'm to discuss the bill list in closed session. Yeah, like, when is it appropriate? I guess that. to ask these right, questions. We can't do that. Um, so here. Bill, yeah, okay. So, okay. Sorry, I just wasn't sure. So this would be okay. when we get the packet. Uh, when we get the packet, I um, would be the yeah, time. Yeah, usually to, I just ran out of time. Would be the time to reach out with, to okay. the department head directly and see um, what the what the situation is. I think that might have been. Yeah. Oh, the other question I had was the for public works. I'm just trying to understand. So when we have, for instance, PSENG and we hire the off-duty police officers, PSENG reimburses us, correct? Yes. 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 Yeah. But then how do like for instance for this one, it says public works paving program, but then it's off-duty. So do we pay for the off-duty cops for paving for police officers? Okay. Yes, in that case, we would pay directly for that out of the capital improvement project. I see. Okay, so for PSCNG, but for paving and right, things like that. If it's a city project. project and not a PSCNG or water company, right. Okay. And then... I think that was it. Okay. Thank you. Council President, as long as we're pulling things out, sure. I'd, I'd like to just quickly um, talk about the micro paving program. Yeah, cool. So this is a great, pro I have to continue the tradition because Steve Bowman did it for a number of years and I've taken <laughs> over just pointing out that this is a great program that allows us to extend the life, the life um, of our uh, roads. It's basically a, a, surf a resurfacing program and so it saves us a lot of money in the long run in terms of, you know, a road that it preserves the life of that road. Um, and so I commend um, uh, Aaron and his staff for their work on this project. I think this year is gonna be an interesting challenge given that half of our roads are are open and, yes. and yes. you know, figuring out what's paved and what's, you know, what's ready to be micropaved might be interesting. That, uh, yeah, and, and it extends the period before We'll have to repave Save. completely. Except if PSC and G right. comes yes. in and yes. cuts the right. whole road open. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Craig, Craig, I have. I, for, I remember my yeah. other question. When I was looking at the bill list, and I was um, asking Megan today uh, in the city administrator's office, and I think I might have asked uh, Michael briefly, but when we talk about animal control services, so we're billing four thousand dollars a month for animal control, mm -hmm. and when I start looking at the numbers, it makes me a little nervous because in twenty. 22, I think we did 121 calls, but I think to date we've done like nine. So what sort of our, like, it seems like it would make, I understand, but it just seems like a lot of money for, and it doesn't seem like we're, yeah. we, we keep, is there, can we revisit this? We keep animal control on retainer, right? And there's a minimum monthly charge. And then Which is 4,000. And then there's a charge on top of that when there's some sort of a animal issue. Um, Wait, so I'm sorry. So the $4,000 does not include the it animal does, capturing? It, I, it doesn't, right? 
I, not having had the liberty to look at yeah. the actual contract, but it is pretty extensive, the, um, the scope of services they do provide and that they're on call. So yeah. having the, have had in the past in another community where you've, you hire an animal control, they, they provide various employees depending upon the level of activity going on. Some months are not going to be heavy, so you would say they really had X amount of calls. Um, but then there's other months where they clearly are earning and probably losing money on it. But it's, so it's that balance of just having that on call. I encourage you, um, and I'll connect you with our uh, health officer who is overseeing that contract and can better speak to uh, what's going on okay. on a monthly basis. But, but the assumption would be it has to be cheaper than new staff. Yeah, yeah, but but yeah. through, yeah. through you, Council yeah. President, I had the exact same question. I and I, I called oh, hi, and, right? and Megan went over it. Um, and it is a common expense. You can even look the company up and see uh, what they do. I remember them talking about um, deer and uh, removing dead, uh, so it is worth your time to look into that. Mm. When you need them, you need them. <laughs> uh, okay, other comments on the consent agenda? Comments from members of the public? All right, we've got uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda is adopted. We're now at the public comment section of the meeting. Uh, we'll welcome comments from any member of the public about issues that are not topics on tonight's business agenda. And we're open. All righty. I will close the public comment section. And moving on to council member comments and new business. What do we have? Lisa. I just want to say something because the stop sign conversation got so fiery. And I just want you to know direct through you, Council President. First of all, I think everybody works really hard. So I just want you to know that um, I really appreciate all the work you do for our city. You get up early, you stay late, um, and you always return calls, and you um, do everything that we need. So I just want to say to Chief Zagorski, I think your team is amazing. Um, having differences and questions and deliberation does not mean I don't appreciate and know how hard you work. So I just really wanted to say that so that there's no confusion that I don't, um, that I do believe um, that you are trying to keep the city safe. So I just wanted to make sure that I said that, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I'd like to say as well, you know, that conversation certainly got heated, but I, I spent hours on the phone today with um, multiple different employees for multiple different reasons, and, and you all do such a wonderful job, and I want, uh, I want all of you to know that, but um, my key takeaway from it is that a lot of times we just have to work together and have some people might have different perspectives in different departments and we might not be covering all the different things. So I think this is valuable discussion. And again, thank you so much for all you do. One, yeah. qu one quick comment. Um, on the home screen of the City of Summit's website, there's a right on the top, there's a blue oval. It says get notified. If you click it, you, fill, you put your email address in it, you will start getting all of these updates from the city. I was not, I did, was not signed up for notifications. I thought, oh, I'm a city council member. I'm going to know everything. Well, let me tell you, as soon as I started getting these notifications, it was eye-opening and so helpful. And I think our communications office has been doing such a great job getting information out there. And um, if you don't <laughs> click get notified, you might not get it. So just wanted to mention that. Second. Second that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, other council member comments? I forgot to say, I just got back from the International Health and Rackets Conference in San Diego, and I just wanted to pass along um, my excitement for what I was able to learn for the community of Summit when I was there, looking at all the latest playground uh, fitness technology and things like that. I got to look at it as a, as a councilwoman, not as a business owner, so I can't wait to share that uh, feedback with you once I get some sleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Other council member comments? This is it. Nope. All right. Uh, at this point, I think we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. And do we have a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? <laughs> All right. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.